Bedford Avenue. It needs to be moved because the tow truck needs to uh, move another vehicle. So is there somebody with a burgundy Jeep that's parked out on 3rd Avenue? Burgundy Jeep. A burgundy Jeep on 3rd Avenue it needs to be moved. I've got one, but it's underneath. Okay. All right. No, we moved it for you. You moved it for me. There's no one for that. <laughs> Okay, I would like to call the October 6, 2015 Longmont City Council session to order. This is a, a study session. Could we please start with a roll call? Mayor Coombs? Here. Council Members Bagley? Here. Christensen? Here. Finley? Here. Levison? Here. Moore? Here. Santos? Here. Mayor, you have a quorum. Okay, let's stand for a Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Okay, for public invited to be heard, uh, the first person on the list is Kevin Kavanoff. So please come down and state your name and address for the record. Fifty four Sundance Drive, Longmont, Colorado. Um, so I've not done this before. So my name uh, my name is Dr. Kevin Cavanaugh. I grew up in Longmont. I'm a solo otolaryngologist, ear nose and throat doctor in Longmont. My dad I came and set up my own practice in two thousand one. And my father is an orthopedic surgeon, set up his own practice in nineteen seventy in Longmont, it's the current orthopedic group. I'm here to speak out against the newly proposed hospital in Longmont. Um, I grew uh, Longmont and its citizens have spent years building the current hospital they have. I've spent, I train in Chicago and Houston, and Longmont has a great hospital and a great staff. And I felt, if we had felt that we need a new hospital in Longmont, then I would more than feel like we need a new hospital in Longmont. UC Health has announced that they're going to build their own hospital after they, built the, at the, after they purchased the Longmont Clinic in 2014. And unfortunately, they decided they're going to build their own hospital and not support the, ho the hospital that our, that our citizens have built in this community. This, our citizens have been, our, our medical community has always been divided between the Longmont Clinic and the clinic doctors. And those doctors have built the current hospital that we have. The UC Health says the reason why we need a new hospital is about patient choice and about competition. We already have seven hospitals within a 20-mile radius of Longmont. And if this current hospital is built, UC Health is also going to build another one at, on Highway 7. So they make nine hospitals in the 20-mile radius. That's more than enough competition. There, isn't an, there aren't enough patients to fill those beds. I train in Chicago, and Chicago doesn't have that density of hospitals, and they have a much larger population. Longmont's current hospital is only 50% capacity, so it's not a capacity issue. So if the new hospital is built, our current hospital will be at 25% capacity, and thus there will be job losses. So people talk about new jobs come with a new hospital. That will just balance out. I have yet to have speak to a non-physician or non-clinic physician in this town who believes that we need a new, new hospital. I've even spoken to clinic doctors who can't speak out because they're now owned by UC Health that don't believe we need a new hospital. The, um, the clinic was in negotiations with the city, or with the, oh, sorry, LUH, to be purchased, and unfortunately the negotiations fell apart. There's been a lot of animosity and bad blood between, between those two entities over the years, and, or, or since that. That rift should not be allowed to drive a larger wedge through Longmont and its medical community. And if this new hospital is built, that's exactly what will happen. Um, UC Health says they're here for the patients. They're here to control the health care dollars and ultimately control the competition. So it's not about competition. They own a bunch of the hospitals on the, up and down the front range, and their ultimate goal is to control the patients. It has nothing to do about treating patients. UC Health's response is they can't own it because they tried to buy Longmont United Hospital then we'll build our own hospitals, not with this community uh, needs. If UCL truly cared about our community and supported it, then the question to them is why don't they support the hospital that our community, its citizens, and its medical community, including the Longmont Clinic, built? Thank you very much. Thank you. Strider Benston. Mayor, if I could interrupt for one second. Uh, Eugene May, City Attorney. Uh, the UC Health matter is subject to appeal from the Planning and Zoning Commission, during which council will serve as a quasi-judicial board. Uh, I would advise council to protect the due process rights of the applicant 
and um, the process that you would make your decision based on the evidence presented at that hearing, not for comments from public invited to be heard. <laughs> Thank you. Strider Benston. Good evening, uh, Strider Benston, 951 17th Avenue. I kind of forget because I actually got out of town for a few days. Uh, first time in in this century I've been able to fly an airplane and um, went to the 50-year reunion of the SCOPE Summer Community Organizing Project in Alabama, South Carolina, and other states. And there were some people here in Longmont who helped me get there, and I appreciate that greatly. And it came out better than I expected. So um, things are going pretty well. I didn't lose anything major except one full bag that I, uh, I haven't been on a plane in so many years, I forgot about after you check a bag, you're supposed to pick it up. <laughs> you know? so, um, so I'm going to try to get back in the next day or two and rescue my bag. Um, yeah, so anyway, um, I just, um, um, them, them folks what helped me, I appreciate it greatly, and I mostly came down to listen and find out what's going on in Longmont. Thank you much. Okay, I, that ends uh, public invited to be heard. So now we have a uh, special report of proclamation designating October 2015th as Pregnancy and Infant Month Loss Awareness Month in Longmont. Marika Barris is the founder of the executive director of my Baby Angel Foundation. Is sure to accept the proclamation. Would you like to say anything before I read it or want me to read it first? Okay, I'll go ahead and read the proclamation. Proclamation designating October 2015th as Pregnancy and Infant Loss Awareness Month in Longmont, Colorado. Whereas on October 25th, 1988, President Ronald Reagan designated October as Pregnancy and Infant Loss Awareness Month by signing the Proclamation 5890 and whereas approximately one in every four women suffers a miscarriage, stillbirth, or infant loss and whereas my baby angel foundation and other organizations work diligently to support women and families who have faced this significant loss and whereas recognizing October as pregnancy and infant loss awareness month in our city will provide bereaved mothers, fathers and family members with acknowledgement of and compassion for the great tragedy that has impacted their lives and whereas bringing public awareness to this grief will help those who feel marginalized in their loss to see compassion to see a compassionate society that can appreciate their suffering and grief now therefore I Dennis L Coombs mayor by the virtue of the authority vested in me and the city council of the city of Longmont do hereby proclaim October 25th as Pregnancy and Infant Loss Awareness Month in Longmont, and I invite all citizens in the community to be aware of My Baby Angel Foundation, which is helping transform our society's response to pregnancy and infant loss. Thank you. So, good evening, Mayor Coombs and City Council members. My name is Marika Barris, and I'm the founder and executive director of My Baby Angel Foundation, 421 21st Avenue, Suite 213 and here in Longmont. And it's good to see all of you again. Today marks the fourth year that we have received a city proclamation recognizing October as Pregnancy and Infant Loss Awareness Month in Longmont. Thank you very much for this. Though this is our fourth year of receiving the proclamation, there are some in the audience and watching the video they may not know it was the death of two of my grandchildren in 2008 and 2009 that put me on this path. I'd like to ask all of you on the council and in the audience to raise your hand if you or someone you know has ever suffered a pregnancy or infant loss. And please take a moment to look around. Thank you. Visually seeing how connected we all are is an important step in implementing change. 
This year, our city, out of all the cities in the world, has been called to help create a more compassionate and inclusive community around pregnancy and infant loss. We witnessed in our community a horrendous crime against mother and baby. Shaken to our core <coughs> in grief, we have not forgotten. The importance of a healthy community lies in its transparency and inclusivity. It is nurtured in understanding, compassion, and love. We must ask ourselves as a community, what has changed to support one in four women, men, and families who suffer a pregnancy or infant loss? Are we as a city asking ourselves the important questions of how to serve an underserved part of our community? It's not about sending them to a nonprofit for support. We must look at how each one of us can directly impact the life of a baby lost mother and father. We begin with what is in our direct vision. There are over 800 employees that work for this city. I'm asking that a more inclusive program be implemented by our city to provide the next level of compassionate care to those mothers, fathers, and families. Whether it's a phone call, a card, a meal, or reasonable paid time off. We take steps in our city to begin a transformative approach to working with pregnancy and infant loss. Through this, we not only will be known as a city where a heinous crime was committed, but rather a city that works towards the well-being of those that have suffered a pregnancy or infant loss. In the handout, that I have provided you, you'll find an invitation to our first candle lighting ceremony on October 15th, Pregnancy and Infant Loss Remembrance Day at the Longmont Museum and Cultural Center. Doors open at 6.15 and the ceremony begins at 6.45. I invite all of you to be there representing and supporting our community. And please share this with our city employees. I've also included 52 ways to support someone who has suffered a pregnancy or infant loss. This was written by a baby loss mother a few years ago in another state. It is filled with ideas from one who knows. In conclusion, my prayer this year is that this proclamation will mean more to us as a community than ever before, that we individually, as a city, in corporate and private business, become the change that will lead to greater health and healing for all. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, we have a, another proclamation designating October 2015th as Domestic Violence Awareness Month in Longmont. Jackie List, Executive Director of Safe Shelter of St. Rain Valley, is here to accept the proclamation. And I'll go ahead and read the proclamation. A proclamation designating October 2015th as Domestic Violence Awareness Month in Longmont, Colorado, whereas domestic violence is a serious crime that affects people of all races, ages, genders, and income levels, and whereas one in three Americans have witnessed an incident of domestic violence, and whereas children who grow up in violent homes are believed to be abused and neglected at a rate higher than the national average, and whereas only, coordinated, only a coordinated community effort will put a stop to this heinous crime. And whereas domestic violence 
Awareness Month provides an excellent opportunity for citizens to learn more about preventing domestic violence and to show support for the numerous organizations and individuals who provide critical advocacy services and assistance to the victims. Now therefore, I, Dennis L. Coombs, mayor by the virtue of the authority vested in me in the City Council of the City of Longmont, do hereby proclaim the month of October as Domestic Violence Awareness Month and urge the citizens of Longmont to work together to eliminate domestic violence from our community. So feel free to speak. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Mayor Coombs and members of City Council uh, for the proclamation. And I'm joined here tonight by Kim Hurd, who is representing uh, Longmont Ending Violence Initiative. We work very closely together to try to see that uh, this dynamic in our community comes to an eventual end. Kim is going to say a few words. I'm going to say a few more. And then I have uh, a gift of a pin for each of you if you will wear those pins through this month. You want to go first? Sure. Okay. So as she said, I'm Kim Hurd, and I work Longmont Indian Violence Initiative across the street at the police department. And I just wanted to say thank you also for um, proclaiming this as Domestic Violence Awareness Month. And just a quick little fact that I was doing some statistics, the statistics today. And this, in the last three months, um, I do all the police reports and um, enter them into a, like a database. There were 189 calls for service for domestic violence in the last three months. So that average is two a day here in the city of Longmont. So I just wanted to kind of pass that statistic on. It's a very high, still a very high cr crime rate with domestic violence in our city, but that's a lot. Thanks, Kim. And, and we do have the, um, I don't know, uh, not an honor, certainly, but we have consistently, for the past five years anyway, had 40%, 40-41% of all the domestic violence incidents in the county more than any other municipality. Those are reported incidents. Um, in the past year, Safe Shelter has served 600 people. 200 of those people were children. Most of the children in our shelter are between uh, three and six years old. Uh, the vast majority of that 200, about 130 of them are under 10. And on behalf of those children, our future citizens, and their non-offending parents, Safe Shelter and Levi, would like to express our appreciation for your res res recognition of domestic violence as one of the most pressing health and safety issues in our community. We at Safe Shelter are grateful to live in a community that allocates funding. That funding is so needed to keep victims safe and to hold offenders accountable. We look forward to a time when everyone in this community and in every community worldwide can live in homes free of intimidation, fear, and violence. Thank you for recognizing this issue. Thank you. I have a quick question. Isn't there a 5K fundraise? Uh, or was, that, is it, that was last Saturday. Oh, yeah. no. I missed it. <laughs> Sorry. But there is a vigil uh, to honor victims and celebrate survivors, and that is taking place Friday night at 6 o'clock, this coming Friday the 9th at 6 o'clock at um, Isaac Walton Clubhouse. And then there's a luncheon, a legacy luncheon, on the 21st of October also. If you visit our website, you can find okay. all of those things. And Thank we you. missed you on yeah, Saturday. I'm, I was looking, darn, for I was you looking forward to that. I was looking forward to that. Thank you.
one, no, two, don't do one to the Okay, now we're ready to start the study session items. Mayor, the first item uh, tonight is a presentation regarding Longmont being a de designated a Colorado Enterprise Zone by the State of Colorado, and Wendy Nafziger from the Longmont Area Economic Council is here to present. Good evening, Mayor, City Council members. I am uh, standing in tonight for Jessica, who couldn't be here. I will be the first to tell you that she knows way more about this program than I do, so I'll do my best to explain. Sean, my handy assistant over here, is going to help me. If there's any questions that I can't answer, we'll make sure they get answered after tonight. And that goes for people in the audience, too. So, Longmont has been designated as part of the North Metro Enterprise Zone. That, let me get here. So that zone was, um, an enterprise zone is a state program designed to encourage economic development in economically distressed areas. The, uh, the areas that were identified, we worked closely with the city staff and Kimberly McKee at the Longmont Downtown Development Authority to establish those distressed areas and to come up with this map. The enterprise zone offers state income tax credits which includes an expansion of the current manufacturing sales and use tax exemption that's offered by the state if you're not in an enterprise zone, and is based on three criteria, high unemployment, low per capita income, or slow population growth, uh, all under the Colorado Statutes 3930-101 to 112. This is a map of Colorado's current enterprise zone. Um, did you hand those out to people? Okay, sorry. So there, uh, Sean's going to hand out a map of what our enterprise zone is now in Longmont. Um, this is the current enterprise zone, which Boulder County has never had an enterprise zone before now. So effective in January 1st of 2016, the North Metro Zone includes portions of Longmont, Lafayette, Broom and Broomfield City and County. This is the first time in 20 years that the state has evaluated zones. As I said, Boulder County has never been in a zone before, and now it's mandatory, mandatory that they reevaluate the zones every 10 years so that, uh, because obviously economic conditions change in places that no longer qualify, or hopefully not the reverse. Uh, so you have a copy of this map. Um, if there's anyone, if anyone else wants copies of the maps, I think I have some extras up here from Sean. We can, okay, he just gave them out. But you can, you can contact me if you are interested. So there are 10 different tax credits and exemptions available in an enterprise zone. I'm going to go over the ones that are most beneficial to our community and most frequently used. The investment tax credit is a 3% state income tax credit on any qualified investment in Section 38 property. Section 38 property is depreciable, tangible personal property, equipment, furniture, computers. You can claim a maximum of $750,000 a year in a tax year, and excess credit can carry forward for 12 years. Investment resulting from an in-state relocation is not eligible unless the relocation results in, so, well, I'll qualify that in a minute. So 10% increase in employment, a 10 employee increase, 100% increase in investment, or a million dollars worth of investment. So what, what this is saying is that companies that are currently in, in say, Denver can't get up and come to an enterprise zone in any place, but not in Longmont or anywhere, just to be in an enterprise zone. You have to do, you have to be eligible to, by increasing employment or uh, a, in a, new, a new facility with a new investment, that kind of thing. There's also a job training credit. This is 12% tax credit on job training expenses. 
So the, um, the state of Colorado offers a Colorado first job training um, as well. You can do both. You can have this if you're in an enterprise zone, and, you, and companies can qualify for both. The requirements are a formalized pro, uh, process through um, the job training credit, and the kind of credits that you can get um, are on airfare, hotel, classes, fees. It can include the salary of a trainer. The only thing it can't do, just like the Colorado First, is it can't pay for salaries. There's also a new employee credit. So if you, as for every employee you hire in the enterprise zone, every new employee you hire, you can get a credit of $1,100 per new employee, and that is a five-year carry forward. I'm going fast, sorry. <laughs> There's also employer-sponsored health insurance credit. This is available for the first two full tax years that you're in the enterprise zone, that the company's in the enterprise zone. Employer pays at least 50% of the cost. It has to be a qualified health insurance plan, and a qualified plan is Affordable Care Act compliant plan. $1,000 per covered employee with a five-year carry forward. The R&D tax credit that the city of Longmont also offers at, for all businesses, but within the enterprise zone, there's another one. 3% tax credit on increased R&D expenditures. Qualifying, qualified expenditures include things as research and experimental expenditures as defined in Section 174 of the Federal Internal Revenue Code. It must be technological in nature. It must be useful in the development of a new or improved product or component of the business. It must utilize the process of experimentation, and it excludes government-funded research, so the labs wouldn't be able to qualify for this if they were an enterprise zone. The tax credit is based on the increase in a company's qualified R&D expenses from the prior two-year average. Credit, equal to three, credit is equal to 3% of the increase and must be spread out over four years, but there's no limit on the carry forward for that. Another uh, credit that could be used, especially in our area, is a vacant commercial building rehab cre rehabilitation credit. 25% tax credit on eligible expenditures. They're limited to $50,000 per building. There's a five-year carry forward and it can be claimed by either the owner or the tenant of the building. Qualifying a building in an enterprise zone is, um, is a little more tough. At least 20 years old, vacant for at least two years, and when we say vacant, you can't have a hammer hanging in there. You can't be storing things in there. It has to be a vacant building for at least two years. And it cannot be... Um, and it has to be rehabbed for commercial use, so you couldn't rehab it for you to, to change into a residence. Qualifying expenditures are hard costs of rehabilitating the qualifying building. Not eligible are the soft costs, costs such as engineering, planning, acquisition. So there's a pre-certification requirement, and we just had a public uh, process on this the other day. Business representatives, um, let, me, let me start over. This is one of the most important things if you're a business in the enterprise zone. Whether you plan to use it, whether you understand it, whether or not, you, if you, it's to your benefit to pre-certify. There's, there's no penalties if you don't use it, but if you aren't pre-certified, you can't use it. So if you're a business in the enterprise zone and are interested in this at all, and, don't, and if you have questions way beyond uh, what I'm talking about tonight, I would, I would encourage you to call Jessica. She'll be back in the office this week. Um, so business representatives attest to awareness of the program and that the easy credits are a contributing factor to the startup, expansion, or relocation of the business, and you're required to certify for all business income tax credits. You have to pre-qualify annually, but you don't have to know which credits you're going to use. So you can go in and pre-certify and not having any idea which of the credits you're going to use. It won't make any difference. The, the other thing that's very important here is you can pre-certify it as soon as you know the address of the building that's in the enterprise zone that you own, occupy, or may be purchasing. 
but before you hire employees. So you can't, you can't get all this done and move in and bring your employees and then say, okay, I'm going to go and I want the credits now. It has to all be done before. Pre-certification is required each tax year prior to conducting activities that may earn an easy credit. I just talked about that. Longmont businesses located in the Enterprise Zone can pre-certify now. You can go to the www.advancecolorado.com slash EZ, and you can, they actually have a map. If you aren't sure by the, the map that we have here, if you aren't sure, you can put your address in, and it'll tell you if you're in Enterprise Zone anywhere in the state. Local administrator, the local administrator will confirm that that business is located in the Enterprise Zone, and the Longmont Area Economic Council is the local administrator for all of the North Metro area. So that's pre-certification. Then certification is um, you certify after, so you certify after you've already um, used the credit. So you hire 10 employees, you're getting ready to do your, your tax returns, then you have to do the certification. You apply for certification of business tax credits with approved pre-certification, which we talked about. Same tax ID and location approved in the pre-certification. Report employment and wage data for program analysis. Report qualifying activity and calculate credit earned. And you complete in advance of filing with the Department of Revenue. You, again, you, you can't file tax returns and then go back and say, oh, I forgot to do this. It has to be in advance, and this is all done, certification is done with your CPA or your accountant. If you, have, um, if you have CPAs or accountants that you're working with that may not be familiar with this, I would strongly suggest you have them um, look, the, look at this, um, I don't know how you do it, Gabe, online or, or call Jessica or however you would do it as a... As a CPA, however, however you want to learn. <laughs> so those are, the, those are the tax credits. There's also manufacturing sales and use tax exemptions. So currently statewide, we have a manufacturing machinery and mach a manufacturing sales and use tax exemption where machinery and machine tools used in the manufacturing process are exempt for state sales and use tax. That's also uh, true here in Longmont. Local governments may opt in for a local exemption, which we do. The criteria for this is it's used predominantly in the manufacturing process. It's a Section 38 property, at least $500 per invoice. It's capitalized, and the form you use is DR 1191. So this, this is, I'm sorry, I, I misstated that. I apologize. This is the current manufacturing sales and tax exemption for everybody in the state, whether you're in an enterprise zone or not. I apologize. I messed that up. This next slide is an expansion of the manufacturing sales and use tax exemption if you're in an enterprise zone. When the machinery is used solely and exclusively in an enterprise zone, um, you, can, you can get this expansion of this, of the sales and use tax exemption. Materials for the construction or repair of machinery and non-capitalized machinery are okay. So that's the kind of the expansion and the difference if you're in an enterprise zone. So to claim the sales and use tax exemption, as I said before, um, you file the form DR 1191 with the vendor at the point of purchase and the Department of Revenue with taxes. This is done with the vendor, not through the Enterprise Zone Administrator, which will be our office. So this, the sales and use tax exemption is a form done with you and the vendor. So just a few facts about Enterprise Zones. There's 3,865 businesses certified, uh, certified enterprise zone business credits in the state fiscal year ending June 30th, 2014, that earned $42.7 million in income tra tax credits. 26,402 donations were certified for the enterprise zone contribution tax credits, which earned taxpayers $11.6 million in income tax credits and bringing $50 million to almost 400 projects. We didn't really talk about that one, but that's, a, that's another one that, that is uh, available through um, the enterprise zone for nonprofits in the enterprise zone or nonprofit projects. I don't have enough information to talk about that tonight, but like I said, Jessica, I'd be happy to answer any questions. 
So our contact information here, um, Jessica Erickson is our enterprise, well, for right now, she is the enterprise zone administrator. Um, as I understand it, we will be hiring someone in January because that's a full-time job to do that. Um, or the state of Colorado, Sonia Gurham, and her information is up there as well. I have this PowerPoint presentation. Um, if it would be helpful, I'm happy to send it to all council members then, and again, Further questions, please go to Jessica, but I'll open it for questions and try to answer them now. Council Member Finley. Thank you, Mayor Coombs. I don't have a question, but I do really want you to thank Jessica for making this happen. This will be quite a boon to our city and look forward to a lot of great things happening in our new enterprise zone. Thank you. Uh, as, as most of you know, Jessica came from the State Office of Economic Development, so she's very familiar with the Enterprise Zone program and was very instrumental in um, bringing this to, to light with Harold and, and the City Council and, and the rest of the staff. Um, so we're happy to have it in our toolbox. I would like to add one comment. I did ask, have someone ask the other day, um, I'm really concerned that the Enterprise Zone is going to bring things to our neighborhood that we don't want. We don't want big fancy buildings. We don't want renovation. We want everything status quo. And that's, that's fine. Um, I just want to make it clear that this is not a requirement. If you own a building, this is just an opportunity if you're ready to do something with that building or if you're a business that wants to locate and get some extra tax credits. So if you're a business and you want to pay more taxes, you don't have to take advantage of this? You do not. <laughs> Councilmember Christensen. Um, yeah, I have a, quite a few questions. Um, actually, when I looked on the map, and I, thank you for this. I think this is a good explanation of everything. And uh, I went to the meeting the other day with uh, that Jessica presented, and you were there. And so thank you for doing this. I think it'll be very helpful for quite a few businesses, um, especially the vacant building rehabilitation tax credit. There are a lot, we keep hearing that we need more Class A um, uh, building space. Right. And this will be a wonderful uh, ability to upgrade some buildings. Um, I'm curious because when I looked on the state website, the map actually goes all the way to Hover, I mean to Airport Road. This That was... That that, that was the, the original one. That was an old map. Oh. The one you have in front of you is a current one. We had that in there to start with, and oh. then um, we were informed that, that that area did not meet the criteria, so we revamped that. Okay. And Erin Klosdick, thanks to her, she did just print me some big maps I'll have up in the office, but the okay. best way to, do, to identify is if, if you want to know, go to the state and type in your address and it'll let you know if you're in there or not. But it does, no. I don't believe it, it doesn't go to Airport Road. And no. Councilmember Christensen, okay. if I could clarify, that's actually because um, our original application, we wanted that area in yeah. as part of the Enterprise Zone, but the state has the discretion to actually modify those boundaries when they okay. make the decision, and they decided to not include that whole area in the, in the okay. zone. Um, when I uh, first heard about this, I thought, what a great idea. We'll get to um, gussy up North Main, which has, like, uh, payday loan stores and kinky underwear stores and things that, you know, we could probably put to better use. Uh, and uh, maybe South Main all the way to Pike. This is our traditional business district and our traditional business, the other one is sort of Pike, or Pratt, rather. I'm curious as to why the whole, this includes a lot of residential areas and it includes the entire um, <clears throat> uh, Greenway, all the way from uh, Sugar Mill to Hover. This isn't really our traditional business area, and I'm curious as to why uh, we're including uh, a lot of Old Town and uh, both East and West, which is all residential. Mm -hmm. Do you want to tackle that, Harold? Okay. <laughs> um, so the, all the criteria is is met the criteria that had to be met including um uh, uh excuse me household income right. population all that that we've really focused on so a lot of those areas that you talked about especially south to pike that that wouldn't qualify because of those things but we really focused on the river corridor project on the river corridor 
to help us to develop that as that's one of the city's priorities? So, so part of it was, so you have criteria that you have to look at within the mm -hmm. census tracts. Right. And, and so as, as they were evaluating it, these were the census tracts that were meeting, I think, the, the most criteria Absolutely. in terms of what they were looking at. And, and when Sean said we actually had it extending out to Hover, yeah. they met some airport. of the criteria, airport. but they didn't, uh, to airport. They met some of the criteria, but they didn't meet all of it. And that was one of the reasons that the state came in and said, we would rather not include that in this. And so it, it was defined by, if you can go to the slide, well, I and, it, and it's by census track and then by blocks. And so depending on how the census track fell, right. fell that's what led some of that. But these are the areas where people actually can still afford to live. That's why they have, they have low income. That's why they can afford to live there. And they are single family homes, so that's why there's not a lot of growth there. And, you know, this is how gentrification kind of gets started so that then nobody can afford to live anywhere. And, I mean, I, I just find it odd to have so much, have this, instead of developing North and South Main Street, this whole area was developed, which I, I find kind of puzzling. Um, I also wanted to confirm with you that the, that the, um, no clapping, please that the, this is a new hire, not a new job. So it would be, it would be new hires to new the job. Uh, right, right. Not new hires. Uh, not just new hires, but an, an actual new job. No, new, it would be new hires. Are you talking about to administer the program or for businesses located I'm in the sure. enterprise zone? Well, I'm talking about the tax credit. Oh, okay. So it because would be anyone you hire. It, it doesn't have to be a new job created. Oh, in, in, okay. in, for instance, if you didn't have a software engineer and you don't have to create a new job for that, it would be anyone to fill the positions you need that are new hires to the company. But it is for an, that would be head, a, for a new job. Increased headcount. Yeah. Right. Because yes. increased the reason I'm count. asking this is because some of this got started in the 80s and it was wildly abused by businesses that would fire all their employees, then rehire them, and the government then was paying for their salaries. So then they would fire them in six months and get more people in for free to work, you know. So I would not like us to waste our money doing that. And I think this says here for new jobs, so that would sort of take care of that problem if that's actually true. Right. And I think that came up at the session it that, did, that yes. you and I were at. And mm -hmm. I think I like to hope that, that the man who asked like that question was being sarcastic, but I mean, you know, it, yeah. that mm -hmm. is exactly what went on, that kind of abuse, and it's also why the, this kind of program was uh, completely shut down for a while in California. But we, we've actually worked on that in Colorado to make it not possible to do some of that stuff. Um, I also wanted to... Uh, let people know that the under the manufacturing uh, tax exemption, it also includes mining machinery and pipelines for natural resource extraction. Correct. We just didn't we just didn't include that in right. this presentation because it's not as um, applicable in Longmont. Okay. For employees, are all any kind of employees eligible for this? Yes. Okay. Yes. There's not a salary requirement. Okay. And Council Member Christensen, so oh, construction sorry. and uh, retail are all included. As long as they, as long as the company employed. meets the criteria, yes. Mm -hmm. yeah. Okay. Mm -hmm. Thank you. And Council Member Christensen, if I can just clear, further clarify on the the zone and the way this is drawn, <clears throat> there's actually uh, there are severe, as Harold mentioned, limitations in terms of how we can draw the boundaries because it does have to follow those census tracts and the blocks within those census tracts. So it may look a little gerrymandered here. The other thing that I would point out with regard to the gentrification is that those residential areas would not qualify for these. You, you could not get tax benefits in those residential areas unless someone came in and. Changed 
change the zoning, which you would have to approve right. before some business could move into there and, and start operating, because those are residential areas that are zoned that way. So there wouldn't be gentrification in the residential areas. In addition, we actually um, were required to limit the residential um, because this program is really for commercial areas. But because of the way the census blocks fall, you have to you know pick up a little bit of residential in some of those blocks. You know, plow down a buy up three. So, I mean, I, I have a friend who lives in Highland in Denver, and this is what people are doing down there. They're they're buying up six houses in a row. They demolish them. This is in a very historic area, and they demolish them and they put up high rises and not without the consent of the well, property owner. That would that would require no. Zoning. They are the and property zoning owners. That would require in a residential zone a zoning change. It would have to come before the city council right. to approve that type of action. Right. Um, if I can tag into what Sean said, there were other areas that we looked at. Um, the problem was too. The other thing you had to manage is that you were also limited on the residential number of residences that could be in the zone. So if if you had too many homes in, based in the census tract then all of a sudden it would creep you over, it would, it would push you over the, the line that they required. And so there was that balance piece based on, on the way the census tracts or the, the blocks actually, in this case, were drawn and what it included and what it didn't include. So that was the other piece, that was the other piece of it is you had to, as you looked at this, you had to manage actually the number of homes that were in those tracks as you were looking at the boundaries. Yeah, I looked at the area. And, um, uh, Third Avenue from, I think, Francis to uh, Bowen. And just on that little area is included, and then a block after it isn't. And so that I understand. It's, it's the way the census. They'd yeah. be surprised to think they're economically distressed. Right. Yeah, it, yeah. It, it's based on a percentage below the state average of slow population growth. So it's there was a lot of criteria that went into this. and. Again, if you have, if you'd like, I'm sure Jessica would be happy to sit down and talk to you about the process. She can better explain it than I. <coughs> Councilmember Levison. Thank you. Um, so again, I guess you're you're going to say that the open space area that's just north of the river is an anomaly because it's in the census tract. That, you know. The prior explanation of Councilmember Christensen. If you look at the way the line is drawn, you know there's Boston Avenue um, and everything. You know south of Boston Avenue is pretty much, you know, county open space north of the river, and then our wastewater treatment plant would be considered distressed and economically not growing. It went by tracks. Okay. Yeah. So you that, had to take a whole tract. That okay. was why that's included like that. Okay. By census. All tract, right. Yeah. Um, and so. How many census tracts in all did you include? You know, this is a state program, not a city program. That's the way I understand it. So it's not what we included. It's what the state. It's what the state approved. Right. Yes. Well, I just want to but, know how many census tracts, because if so much was residential and stuff, it's, it's hard when people ask you questions about how did the map get come up with. Sure to explain where the census tracts are. Sure, and I, I do not know the answer to that question, but Sean will, Sean will write okay. that down and I will get you the answer to that question. We'll get that to everyone. Okay, great. And then, um, so anybody can just look up whatever property. Um, okay, uh, you know, I'd be interested to see how this actually um, plays out because of, uh, uh, you know, what the different possibilities are for the, the area. Um, I also find it, you know, interesting that that so much of um, Southmore Park is included as well. So I think we'll just have to keep an eye on this. And then, is there a way that people can track how many applications are coming in? Are you going to do a status report to council, like every quarter with your quarterly report from LAEC? Um, I would assume so. I'm, there is a strict set of um, requirements that uh, reporting requirements at the state level for the enterprise zone. So that would be no pro that would be no problem to do that also at the city council okay. level. And then the person that you're going to hire in your office, who pays for that? The state pays for it? As I understand, and I'm not really positive on this, we can find this out for sure, that the state pays for a portion, and then the other two cities, the Broomfield, and the city and county of Broomfield and Lafayette pay for a portion, and we pay for a portion. So it'll be split five, 
four, four five ways, since four Broomfield's ways. just one. Right. And so what's the estimated salary of the administrator? I do not know that answer. Okay. Uh, Jessica's working through that right now in okay. terms of the posting of the position, um, but it is the combination of the, of the state, Broomfield, Lafayette, mm -hmm. and LEC. And then the one other question I have, and you can get these details to us later, is when you're <laughs> noting that you cannot, anybody who's receiving federal money can't be part of the enterprise zone, does that include stuff like um, the Small Business Innovative Research Grant Program and any money from SBDC? I, I, would, I don't know about SBIR, okay. but SBDC it shouldn't because that's a, I, but I don't know that answer. Which. Because that's a federal program okay. too, though. We'll find out from yeah. So I guess I, I'd just like to know, you know, if people are looking at this and we're looking at kind of the focus of innovation and research, um, just to make sure people understand that if they apply, that they're not going to be disappointed by how many other, you know, say for example, you know, you're doing, you know, federal grant work on something that's kind of a sub-grant um, for something. And, you know, I, I guess we can look at the, the folks that do some of the stuff for the, the uh, space mission stuff that's off of, uh, I can't remember the name of the company now. Anyway, they do um, mirrors and, and other stuff. Anyway, would they be eligible because they are taking NASA grant money and subcontracting? So just a couple of questions like that to see how, how difficult the restrictions are going to be. I think the there was a slide up front that said that if you were receiving government, other sources of government federal money, you were not eligible. As well, well and, it, and, it, and it depends. depends so contract. it's government funded research. Yeah, so yeah, if, you have research. A, if you have a government contract, <laughs> that's not the government funded research. And so when you work with these companies in an enterprise zone, it's really, you get into the details of exactly what they're doing mm -hmm. and, and what that funding source is because they can have a contract in some of these. They just can't have the funded research as part of this. And, and that's <clears throat> the details when you really get in and start working with these businesses, you have to start gathering. The other thing is, is that's part of the R&D tax credit. There are other programs within the enterprise mm -hmm. zone that don't necessarily have this restriction. So it may mean that they don't go for this portion of it if they did have government funded research, but they could go for other grants that are included in the enterprise zone designation. Okay, and then just one, one more question. So just like the urban renewal law allows individual property owners to opt out, if you're a property owner that wants to opt out of that, can you do so? Yeah, this, this is you have to pre-certify if you're interested. You do not, okay. there is no requirement to do this whatsoever. Right. It's just a tool to use if you would like. It's, com it's completely up to the property owners whether or not they want to participate in this. Okay, great. Thanks for answering the questions. And I would note, I would note that the, the state of Colorado, Sonia Gurham, um, who will get you the contact, um, they've been doing this a long time, and individual businesses or individual property owners should contact her with specific questions like you were just asking about federal funding and how they can, what they qualify for. Council Member Santos. Thank you, Mayor Coombs. So the takeaway is if you're in the enterprise zone, pre-certify ahead of time. And, and if I remember correctly in the presentation that Jessica gave, you have to certify every year. Correct. So pre-certify. So if, if you do some of these things and you go to your uh, accountant, this is, all, this is all state tax credits, not federal tax credits, but state tax credits. Make sure you, uh, at least your CPA or whoever does your taxes is aware of all the rules and regulations um, so that you could potentially take full advantage of those without filing your your uh, Colorado state income ta uh, state uh, income tax, and then go back. Oh, wait a second! And for what Jessica said, there is no. They will not go back and say, "Oh, I'm sorry, you." Not ever. Will allow you? Not ever. No, That's they're not going to do that. Do. In fact, she said in her time that at the uh, state economic development office, that never occurred. So, um, sign up, and as uh, Wendy said, that you can pre-certify. You don't have to take any uh, advantage of any of these, but if you do, there's some. There's a lot of tracking involved. Is what another thing I got out of that. You have to track quite a bit. But that and that's what our local, our administrator and our office will be here to help. There'll be someone full time to help companies work through all of that tracking and what they need and what their qualifications are. Well, and this will hopefully uh, spur some more um, uh, primary employers and uh, that are currently there in the enterprise zones, but also that may be coming into those enterprise zones uh, to bring uh, more jobs to Longmont. So Correct. thanks for the uh, information, and uh, we look forward to talking to Jessica another time. 
Thanks. I would like to also clarify that just to make again the the enterprise zone are state tax credits that nothing local we have our own local incentives this is completely separate of the local incentives thank you I don't see any other questions <laughs> thank you for your time mayor the next item is a public hearing on the proposed 2016 operating budget and proposed 2016 to 2020 capital improvement program and final direction from council Jim Golden at the helm Mayor, members of council, Jim Golden, Director of Finance. And uh, well, this, is, uh, this item does have the, the budget public hearing for the budget and the CIP, uh, and we will um, allow the public an opportunity to comment on, on both of those documents here in a little bit. Uh, first wanted to uh, have a couple of um, presentations from staff. Uh, first, we decided last week to uh, put off the uh, presentation regarding priori priority-based budgeting and how it's used in the budget process for 2016. So we wanted to uh, walk you through that briefly tonight, to give you an idea of how that's been uh, considered. And we have been using priority-based budgeting in our last two budget processes in uh, uh, comparing any of the requests that we received throughout the organization, but primarily in the general fund to evaluate um, the, uh, each of the individual requests to see, you know, which quartiles those requests are, are falling into. And um, we, the reason why we really are, are uh, concentrating on the general fund is because obviously it has the, uh, the most amount of competition for a limited amount of resources, and so therefore uh, uh, it's coming from multiple departments and such, and so we uh, utilize that heavily in, in the general fund process, making sure we try to identify every requ request that we receive. So this here, uh, to just give you um, kind of a sense of how our, and this is our 2014 budget, which is the uh, um, last budget which we have a full um, valid uh, data RAD tool, resource alignment diagnostic tool for. We actually, uh, our 15 one is, is currently, uh, we're trying to validate data on it currently, so I can't use that data here tonight, but I'm pretty confident it's not dramatically different than what we show here for the 2014 budget. But this is the allocation of resources in the city's general fund for 14, $65.4 million of, of budget within the RAD tool. And it shows you here that we have, um, throughout the four quartiles, we have only 3.4 percent of our of our uh, 14 budget that is um, from the fourth quartile. Um, so what what I wanted to do is talk to you a little bit about uh, how our additions in the 2016 budget are are um, how they're represented across the quartiles. So earlier in presentations to the council, we identified that the proposed 2016 general fund budget has a little over $3.2 million of new ongoing resources within the general fund. And um, this is um, a summary of how that $3.27 million is broken down across the four quartiles. Um, again, here showing that majority of these dollars are in the first and second quartile. and. Um, Third and fourth, not as much. And you see in the fourth quartile, we have 4.3% of those requests of $140,000, almost $141,000 there. A couple of weeks back, I think on, on the 15th of September, uh, we um, gave you a, an attachment that is part of uh, the budget documents on page S21. And I think I've asked, I gave one to Don tonight so that the council had it on their desk because we didn't. We meant to get it in the packet again tonight, but we missed it. So I wanted to have that in front of you once again so that you can uh, see um, 
the detail of the $3.2 million that, that I'm referring to currently. And in the right-hand column of that, and this attachment is up in the back um, where the, the uh, council packet is as well if the public is interested. But in the right-hand column, uh, it gives you the uh, summary breakout of the $3.27 million of expenses that are proposed to be added in the general fund budget. So um, now what I've got listed here on the slide is a number of those line items uh, from workers' compensation on down um, to the exceptional pay program. Um, these, all of these um, are program expenses. Most of these, except for one, the fleet lease charges, are salary and benefit type uh, expenses, and they've all been allocated across all of the four quartiles. So what I'm showing up here on the slide is the amount of dollars from each of these line items that lands in the fourth quartile. And there's some estimation that goes into this because until we actually go through the costing process in 2016, we won't know exactly how much dollars are going into each program, but this is based on the allocations that we had in, in uh, 14 and 15 and using the same assumptions about where those dollars may go for each of these different type of, of purposes. So as you can see, I'm not going to take you through each one of them, but again, most of these are all salary and benefit type increases. They total $71,770 of quartile four expenses. Now in addition to that, we also have uh, broken out uh, specifically the proposed level one expenses that fall into our fourth quartile. Our ongoing level one request totaled $484,000 for uh, 2016. 179,000 of it is in uh, quartile one, 169 in quartile two, 169,000, 133,000 in quartile three, and then only $1,516 in quartile four. And these are the, are the four line items which uh, fall into those fourth quartile for our level one type expenses. Level one are the type expenses, as you may recall, that we're going to incur whether we fund them or not because we're uh, kind of tied into them um, or already spending the money or contracted to, to see that increase. And then looking at the, the ongoing level two requests. Councilmember Levison. Thank you, Mayor. Um, Jim, could you go back one slide, please? Oh, there, there. Um, so I thought when we negotiated the St. John's parking lot lease with the um, uh, Denver um, dioceses that we weren't supposed to have any increases. I thought we did one flat rate for the three years and it was supposed to be consistent. Mayor Coombs, members of council, I, I'm not sure about that, but if you would like us, this $230 I just remember from the contract, item. you know. <laughs> yeah. So I just, I'm just asking a quick question about that, and then what year are we in in that three-year lease? Is this the last year of it? Barb, I, I'm going to have Barb answer that question. I thought Harold was going to do it. There were increases every year. Oh, there were. Okay. Mm -hmm. Okay. All right. And then what year are we in the lease right now? It was a three-year, right? We have two. This is two or three. Is it? I think it's two. We're three. in year two. We have one more one year. One more year. Okay. Thanks. All right, so then moving on to our, our level two request in the general fund total $260,000. And by quartile, they break down as quartile one for $21,900. Quartile two is $67,000. Quartile three is $104,000. And in quartile four, four we have $66,801. And so I have on this slide here I identified um, those quartile four type expenses. Um, we've discussed these uh, during the budget process already. Um, four items that make up those, uh, that total. So, you know, this level, um, sir, there's one more item actually, and that this is the, uh, this is uh, ongoing expenses for, uh, that are related to one-time expenses. So we are, are budgeted to purchase a new treasury scanner from one-time expenses. And there's uh, quartile four type expenses on the ongoing maintenance for the treasury scanner, which we would love to have right now because you don't know how much trouble that's causing us right now, making our deposits. So um, 
So anyway, this analysis, what I, the type of information I'm giving you here is just concentrating on quartile four. I do have this type of data for quartile three, quartile two, one. It's, it's, it becomes voluminous at that point. Uh, there's a limited amount of quartile four expenses here, easy enough for me to identify those for you here in this slideshow and, and in uh, communication. It's a lot more information when we start getting into those other quartiles. We did cover a lot of those uh, ongoing expenses uh, uh, level one and level two ongoing expenses during the earlier budget presentations. But there's at least uh, five times as much dollars allocated to quartile three as there are to quartile four to just give you a, an idea of what we might be looking at if we were to break it down. But if anyone's interested, I could certainly prepare and forward that data to the council. So our goal when we um, are, are using uh, priority-based budgeting is to ensure that our resources are being directed towards programs that support more of the council's, uh, at, the, at council's desired results in the program attributes of the program. So um, we, what we've done is we, uh, the breakdown of the $3.2 million does support that pretty much through most of those dollars being allocated towards quartile one through three programs need to realize it's always going to be quartile four programs under this type of, of uh, priority-based budgeting program. What we can do is we can uh, eliminate lower scoring programs, but because of the way the allocation takes place over standard deviation, there will always be other programs that drop into quartile four. So it's, it's not as simple as to say, well, let's stop doing the quartile four programs will reallocate and there will still be new quartile four programs. I think our, our intention is to try to make sure that those programs are scoring high, as high as possible, meaning that they are, you know, impacting the program attributes that, that are important to us as well as the desired results. If they have low scores, then we should be concerned about whether or not that we should be doing those if they're not impacting those results. So what we're going to do in the near future, uh, as I have the 2015 data finalized, I, will like, I would like to take some time in a study session to bring you a little bit more information on those, those uh, uh, overall programs that are scoring in the fourth quartile and their scores so we can take a look at those in more detail um, outside of the budget process. But I just wanted to at least tonight give you the idea of how we utilize this for 2016. Any questions on the priority-based budgeting? I don't see any. Okay. So then moving on, um, what I wanted to do now is to uh, cover some information before you get into uh, your um, budget, he public, your public hearing as well as, as uh, after the public hearing, we'll ask the council to give us the final direction on the budget so that we can prepare ordinances for your action um, beginning next week. So first, I'm uh, going to highlight some changes from what information that you have um, received in the, in the past weeks. Uh, we brought you financial policies recently, realized after our presentation last week that by using uh, the additional $650,000 of property tax, that would actually restate this uh, financial policy on human service agency funding because there are more tax dollars to be considered. And so that actually resets the percentage at 2.05% of the um, general funds budgeted ongoing tax revenues. Last week, I believe we told you it would be 2.07%, and that's the change as a result of the 650,000. I want to first bring that to your attention. A couple of the um, programs that we realized that we did not bring to your attention during the budget process that we should have uh, because uh, these are our new expenses or ongoing expenses, new ongoing type expenses for uh, 2016. The first of these is at least, we, uh, earlier this year the council directed us to add $330,000 of ongoing expenses, or I'm sorry, of expenses in the, the um, 2015 budget for the Latino Chamber of Commerce. And so we did have a, a source of, but of funding to continue that in 2016 from uh, funding that was no longer being utilized in our economic development portion of the budget. So that has been included in this post budget for 2016, but 
since it wasn't part of that $3.2 million that I just referenced, we failed to bring that to your attention previously. And secondly here, um, there's an, another $20,000 of expenses in the 2016 budget that will be used, again, from the same source, uh, be used and added to $30,000 of carryover from our 2015 budget uh, to uh, do a Southeast Longmont Urban Renewal Plan study. So any questions on those two items? Council Member Levison. Um, Jim, so what would um, be the scope of the study? Because the urban renewal plan, you know, has been in place for maybe a decade now. Are we just updating the blight study? What are we doing? We'll let Sean answer that. Council Member Levison, uh, members of council, uh, David Starnes actually proposed this, um, and and as part of that proposal, what he was wanting to do was update that plan, which is now 10 years old, um, and so most communities update those about every five years, so it's really a little overdue. The other thing that he wants to do is really look at the boundaries. As you know in our discussions about the Southeast Urban Renewal Area, and in fact in some of your comments on the last item, um, there's a lot of open space, there's the city property, Dickens Park, all sorts of par properties that are in the Southeast Urban Renewal Area that really probably don't belong there because they can, they're not commercial, uh, so they could never benefit the tax base if we ever enacted TIF and that sort of thing, nor could they benefit from the urban renewal status. So looking at the boundaries, um, making some adjustments to that, as well as adjusting the plan to account for the fact that the state law has changed with regard to these urban renewal areas. Um, so a number of questions, including the question of TIF, when, we sh when could we, should we enact TIF, um, for instance, the Butterball development, which will be in that Southeast Urban Renewal Plan uh, area, um, you know, is that an opportunity to start collecting TIF revenue um, before that um, property hits the tax roll? So a lot of questions to be asked and the fact that it hasn't been updated in 10 years. So that, well, I thought that the TIF can't be retroactive, so if it's been I mean, uh, tax increment financing is the, you know, the increment dis difference. So um, are we talking about not the, the um, stuff that's going to go vertical now, but the rest of the property, that, uh, you know, the open, the vacant land that had never had anything built on it? Uh, Councilmember Levison, it's actually both um, because this the, the the first phase of Butterball won't won't hit the tax rolls until 2017 and potentially even part of 2018, uh, all of it would hit. And so we actually believe that there is an opportunity to um, TIF if that's financially viable. We really need some assistance running some of those financial calculations, et cetera. Um, but we do have the potential to TIF both phases um, or actually all three phases mm -hmm. of the Butterball development redevelopment. All right, I think it's I'll, also. I'll check in with you later about other details on that. Yeah, so I, I think it's a, just a holistic review of, of the entire area. You know, we also have the DDA that that so to, that overlaps in that, and seeing what financial capacity actually does sure. exist in that area. So it's it's really a wholesale review mm -hmm. of of the plan that was created ten years ago. And sometime in the future, it'd be nice to see where the overlaps are from the enterprise zone presentation and and the um, you know the the urban renewal study area. We haven't actually pulled the trigger on any kind of urban renewal plan yet. I would also like to point out on this slide is that um, this is a, a reuse of dollars that existed within the budget itself. This is not new funds going into these projects. Um, specifically, the request for the Southeast um, Urban Renewal Plan was, was put in for one-time funding, but based on the needs that we had in terms of uh, other capital infrastructure needs. It wasn't something that we funded with those dollars, and so they, they work within their budget um, to look at these two pieces. Okay, so now I want to move on to a couple of other, a couple of new changes. Uh, so we just keep changing this budget on you, but I'm sorry to say that. But uh, I apologize for that, but we do have a couple of final changes because we have no more time to make changes after tonight, right? Uh, one first to bring to your attention um, is that we found that we had under budgeted our, our exceptional pay 1% program that at least only in the general fund we under budgeted by um, um, the amount of $18,117 which was the amount of the benefit costs related to that program. Uh, we did, uh, we were able to include the benefits in all the other funds but um, in uh, our haste to balance the general fund, we uh, did not include the benefits uh, in, in that fund. So 
that's what oh and I just will point out that I'm recommending that come from part of the remaining balance of the property tax that we discussed last week as well which I will talk a little bit further about in a few minutes and then the other change is for two positions within Public Works Natural Resources that uh, were not classified correctly in our uh, pay plan for 2016 since been corrected uh, their uh, total impact of $23,993. Uh, one of these positions is split over four funds. So as you see on the slide, this is the breakdown of the allocation uh, increase in cost for each of these four funds as a result of these corrections to these uh, classifications for the two positions. Um, so um, then there are more corrections uh, to the original 2016 proposed budget. Um, these are more of uh, the um, types where we found mistakes within our budget that needed to be corrected. First is uh, our cost for exceptional pay, the 1% exceptional pay in two, two smaller funds. The Callahan House Fund needed to be increased by $329 and the open space fund was overstated and needs to be decreased by $3,183. And then uh, finally we found that our, uh, within our DDA, and this was actually um, part of um, the DDA statements that you received last week with your packet, in that, um, those fund statements we corrected and removed um, CIP project DR19 for $175,000, which was already uh, budgeted for in 2015, and the DDA mistakenly included it again in their, their request for 2016. So we did remove that in the amendments that you received last week, but I'm just pointing that out here. And it, it, it decreases the debt service by 115000 because there was a $60,000 outside source of revenue for that as well. And then uh, finally, we have a correction in the DDA Debt Service Fund of uh, increase of $67,607. And the Debt Service Fund really is where we are taking the tax increment revenues and loaning it out either to the Construction Fund or the DDA A&E Fund, where we actually had our, our projects budgeted correctly, but we did not have the, uh, the loan from the, um, from the Debt Service Fund budgeted correctly. So... Um, part of the confusion of adopting seven different fund budgets for the DDA. So these are the DDA budget changes that we did discuss last week. Uh, so I'm bringing those changes to your attention since they were, again, changes to the original budget. They proposed increasing the administrative assistant from 0.85 FTE to a full FTE. This is the cost impacts of those changes. And then they also propose to add project management fees for their TIF projects, which is a $45,000 uh, estimate for 2016 and has impacts in a number of funds, the construction fund, the operating fund, the debt service fund. Okay, so I wanted to um, talk a little bit about the affordable housing funding uh, because I think I've... Uh, with all the changes we've made, I think we have confused you thoroughly, and I wanted to make sure you understood uh, our, where we started from and where we're ending up at. So our, our original proposal in your budget that you received in the beginning of September was a uh, $450,000 towards affordable housing, and the source of funding was ongoing dollars in a general fund of $250,000. $50,000 of one-time dollars from the general fund, and then $150,000 from human service agency funding. So we, we talked about this during September and the fact that the $150,000 actually could not be provided uh, in full in 2016. Uh, the source of that funding, um, the child care certificate program, was going to continue through the uh, needed to be continued through June of next year, so we could only use $75,000 of human service agency funding for affordable housing. Um, there's no change to the human service agency funding's budget. It's just where it's going. No change in the total amount, I should say. 
So uh, what we're re our revised proposed now, based on what we discussed last week, is a half a million dollars of ongoing resources for affordable housing. And that's coming from the, uh, again, the $250,000 that I just referenced. Uh, that was originally ongoing dollars from the general fund. Another $175,000 that we re recommended last week from that property tax, dollars of 650000 total. And then uh, the remaining um, $75,000 from the Human Service Agency funding we just discussed, total of $500,000. Question on that at all? Okay, so I wanted to now summarize what our recommendations were for the, the use of the $650,000 of property tax. Again, I just mentioned the $175,000 for affordable housing. Um, the next few items are items that we had in the general fund budget from, uh, from one-time dollars that we are recommending moving to ongoing. The PC replacements, phone and video system maintenance, bulletproof vest replacements, taser replacements, and then the mosquito control. All of those we are recommend using ongoing dollars for that. And then we discussed last week a change in the pay plan for the fire pay compression impacts. And then, as I just brought up tonight, the change for the exceptional pay benefits of $18,117. That leaves the difference of $143,275 of property tax that would be unused but budgeted in a contingent line item. And we would, use, we would hold on to that to see what our final, um, a final uh, property tax n number is from the county and to see if necessary if we need to reduce our revenue source from that source this is where it would come from first questions on the 650,000 and, and I think just for clarity for um, the folks that are watching this in the audience is the certification on the property tax doesn't come in until November so the the numbers that, that we're utilizing for the 650 is an estimate that we received and, and, and so um, we're not sure it could be reduced. And, and if it's reduced, the 143 would allow us to absorb that within the budget. So um, further, another thing we discussed last week as a recommendation. So the items that I just mentioned that were, were previously one-time expenses, they free up one-time dollars, 50000 of affordable housing, and then 290000 and change from those items that were on the last slide. Uh, so $340,825 we would instead now transfer to the Public Improvement Fund for uh, infrastructure projects, and these three projects are where we have recommended that those dollars be um, allocated. HVAC replacements for 60000 Boiler replacements for fifty thousand, and roof improvements for two hundred and thirty thousand eight hundred and twenty-five dollars. So, uh, and then I just now these are changes, and I've just I'm kind of restating some of these because uh, these are the impacts to the budget itself that I want to state because they will be reflected, assuming that the council gives us this direction as recommended. This is how it would be reflected in our. Um, our ordinances, um, the changes from the original document that you received. It's going to increase our general fund revenue from property tax by 650000 um, increase our ongoing, affording, uh, ongoing funding to affordable housing by 175000 reduce our one-time funding to affordable housing by 50000 Going to add the transfer from the general fund to the public improvement fund of $340,825, as I just detailed. It'll increase the revenue and expenses within the public improvement fund in that amount as well. Increase our expenses in fire by $22,783. Increase, and that's for the compensation compression issues. Increase our expenses in the general fund by $18,117 for the exceptional pay benefit costs. And then finally, it'll add $143,275 in a contingent uh, line item from the remainder of the property tax. 
So that is uh, all that I had in my slideshow. I wanted to point out one other change because uh, within the last really hour and a half or so, Nick Wolfram brought to our attention a um, correction that needed to be made to the CIP on uh, page 166, which is the fund statement for the street improvement fund. There's no change within the budget itself. This is for the year 2019 in the CIP, but we had a um, significant error in the calculation of our expenditures in the street improvement fund so that the uh, 2019 expenses were um, all stated on that page, but it totals incorrectly. And so it was significantly understated in the expenditures and therefore overstating our working capital and instead of having $11.8 million of working capital at the end of 19 uh, and 11.9 at the end of 2020, we instead would have uh, $1.1 million, as it shows on the fund statement that you have for, for 2019 and 1.2 for 2020. And I will point out, we will get you a corrected formal page statement next week, and we are checking uh, as well on um, our sales and use tax projections that are, are also being questioned and that might have another further impact. This doesn't impact any of the ordinances you'll see next week because it's for future years and not 2016. So with that, um, a few more comments before um, I uh, ask the council to hold its public hearing. Uh, last week a question was raised from the public about the amount of the 2015 budget as reported in the proposed 2016 budget. Our 2016 proposed budget is a total of $300.6 million as originally proposed to you um, at the beginning of September. Within that proposed budget, we include for comparative purposes the originally adopted 2015 budget of $273.1 million. And the budget and CIP are planning documents. In order to give the council and the public a fair and a comparable perspective between the budgets, we use the original budgets uh, for 2015 and 16 so that we have an apples to apples comparison. Uh, it was mentioned last week that we are understating the 2015 budget by 124.7 million. And that's an old number. The 2015 budget actually has been amended nine times. Uh, since the originally since it was originally adopted last October and as of last week's actions which, which was the ninth ordinance that you adopted this year the uh, total budget is four hundred and thirty two million one hundred and ninety four thousand nine hundred and fourteen dollars uh, the additions to the budget for each of those nine amendments are identified to the City Council and the public in each ordinance and the accompanying council communications that we have brought to you pretty much close to on a monthly basis throughout 2015. On May 19th, council adopted ordinance 02015-25. That increased the 2015 budget by $119.2 million. That's our carryover ordinance, which we do every spring after we close the books for the prior year. All of the city's appropriations in its budget lapse each year except within the public improvement fund. That's underneath the city's charter. Thus, in order to complete the projects that are initiated in prior budgets, it's necessary to amend the budget to uh, add the carryover amounts from the prior year. This year, that ordinance that I referred to included over $39 million of, of sewer funds for uh, for bond issues that were made previously, plus the bond issue that was just uh, completed uh, last month. It includes uh, $17.7 million of street fund project, and I should point out that that, I should back up and say that that bond uh, that we closed last month was originally budgeted in 2014, which is why we had to carry it over includes over $17.7 million of street fund projects that needed to be completed, included over $14.5 million of proceeds from our certificates of participation for the public improvements at the Village of the Peaks that 
still needed to be completed and paid. It, complete, it, concluded, it included over $5, $5 million of storm drainage bond proceeds that, again, we need to carry over and complete those projects. Had over $4.4 million of broadband uh, projects from bond proceeds that were issued down in 2014. And much, much more. I just gave you the larger projects. Uh, we also do uh, appropriate for grants that we received during the year, and we received very large amount of CDBG disaster recovery grants that also uh, account for some of the increases, not from that ordinance, but from later in the year. As a planning document, the budget and CRP are expected to provide useful comparative data. Thus, we use the original budget uh, for the prior year to compare it to the, to the proposed budget for 2016. The comprehensive annual financial report is the document that we're required to complete and file with the state and actually reports both our original and our amended budgets as well as the actual expenses and the balances that we have in ha on hand on each of our funds. Uh, between that comprehensive annual financial report and the information that we include with the appropriation ordinances that we take to the council during the year, both the council and the public have full and complete access to the full budget data and the actual audit expenses of the city. And, you know, I may have an accounting slant at times, but, you know, that audited data is much more important than the budgeted data because you really want to know how much we spent. So tonight, um, well, let's complete my comments in regard to our budget comparisons. So, so just to, to give you something that, you know, Jim and I have talked about tonight, um, later in the agenda, um, Dale's going to talk about the National Disaster Resiliency Competition. So to kind of bring a real-world example on that one, um, we didn't budget for it because it's a competition and we don't know. We could receive zero. We could receive $30 million, We could receive $50 million. We'll know when it's awarded. Um, and he'll talk in detail about but they'll make the decision in January. So what happens in that case is that it, let's say theoretically we're awarded $40 million. We then have to bring the appropriation ordinance to council because we were awarded the $40 million. Then those projects are going to lapse because it's not something you finish in one year. So what you're not spending in that year, you would then have to carry over. And, and that's exactly what, what Jim's talking about in this case. And in that carryover, as we discussed with council when we brought that to you earlier in the year, there were a lot of those CDBGDR, the FEMA pieces, the, you know, a lot of it was related to flood recovery, which made it, it look a bit unusual in this. But we also had the other big projects. Next slide. And, and so I just wanted to kind of give you an example of this is something that you may see actually early next year if we're fortunate enough to be successful in this competition. So, um, as you know, the council, the charter requires the council to hold a public hearing on the proposed budget on or before October 1st. You did that last week on September 29th. Council traditionally does schedule and advertise a second public hearing uh, before the ordinances are considered, and that is tonight to give the citizens another opportunity to comment on any of the items included in the budget before we bring back those ordinances next week and then before you give us uh, direction as well. So tonight, uh, we again have a uh, proposed budget originally proposed at $300.6 million. And we also have the proposed 2016-20 CIP, which includes $78 million of projects in 2016 that are part of that $300 million proposed budget. So with that, unless you have questions for me, I'm going to step away and let you hold your public hearing. Council Member Bagley. Thank you, Mayor Coombs. I've just got a quick question. The, uh, and I'm, I'm, I, it, people are either here based on the stickers because they're against fast track or train noise. Mm -hmm. I'm guessing it's train noise. So uh, before we start the public hearing, my question is, have we budgeted anything into the CIP for quiet zones? How much would it cost? What is staff currently thinking about quiet zones? I, I just I'd like to know, and then I'm sure they'd ask, like to know, and then we'll. I'm going to ask public works staff to answer that question. Thank you. 
and then I'll jump in as well. Mayor Coombs and uh, members of council, um, Dale Rademacher, general manager of Public Works and Natural Resources. Uh, the quiet zones T94 is shown as unfunded in your current CIP. Um, T127, I believe it is, which is the improvements at First and Emory Street. We are amending uh, T94 to reflect that a portion of T127 will create a quiet zone right there at Emory. Um, the key thing to know about the, the project at First and Emory, though, is that it was driven by a safety need due to increased volumes of traffic at that intersection. It was not uh, considered or brought forward uh, solely for the purpose of creating a quiet zone. So it, it includes a traffic light at First and Emory. Uh, it also inc includes the appropriate crossing arms so that we can clear the track uh, of automobiles in the case of a train coming. Those are all related to the redevelopment at 150 Main Street, which is why the developer at 150 Main Street is contributing $500,000 towards that project. <clears throat> and so um, I think staff is also uh, prepared to come back to City Council and update uh, certainly the Council with regards to all the work that we did back in 2010 um, regarding quiet zones, uh, both on the sort of the comprehensive study that we did on, on each of the crossings, as well as uh, phasing strategies for the Council to consider. Um, I will also say, as Jim mentioned earlier, the, streets, uh, the street fund at this point, uh, we believe in PWNR is probably close to zero. Um, at the end of the five years. And so if you decide that you want to fund something in quiet zones of any magnitude, you will need to unfund uh, another project. And as you'll recall, when we went for the extension of the street sales tax, um, we talked to the public about the need for flood control and funding of the new bridges on the St. Vrain. That is where the bulk of the capital dollars have been targeted in the street fund over the next several years. Thank you. So to, to, to add some additional information to your question, so, so part of it is a CIP look. Um, I can say that I've asked Dell and Nick to, to look at this um, in more detail and, and provide me some information so we can look at the phasing piece of this. Um, the, the other component is that's not all we're doing. So um, we are, um, Sean can, can update you on the conversations that he's having. We're part of the coalition with um, Loveland, Fort Collins, um, where we're all um, looking at the train noise issue and, and working the legislative angle on this one. And if you want, Sean can update you on those activities. Um, Sean. Uh, council uh, member Bagley, uh, members of council, last week actually um, in attending the North 287 Transportation Coalition, which Longmont is a part of, uh, we signed off on our participation in a letter to Senators Gardner, uh, uh, Bennett, and Congressman Polis uh, to ask them for their continued support um, to, in working with the Federal Rail Administration um, to reopen the train horn, horn rule. Um, as you may recall, um, we thought that that rule was getting reopened, um, and the FRA came back and said, well, we've decided just to open a portion of that. So we're expressing our concern about um, that. And the reason that this is important is because the way the Federal um, Rail Authority has written the rules, it's extremely expensive to develop these quiet zones. In the past, that was less expensive. Um, and, and in addition, we think that there are ways to do this more inexpensively um, and just as effectively. So in another Another um, aspect, we're also supporting the city of Fort Collins, who has asked for, um, they've written their own quiet zone process for their trains that go through their downtown area. They have submitted basically what would, we would call a variance um, to the train horn rules, and we have um, publicly sub, uh, submitted our support for that particular variance to the FRA when we did our um, lobbying trip, um, the mayor and I did uh, last year, or actually earlier this year. And then um, 
Also, we uh, learned that um, COG, Dr. COG, um, which we're a part of, of course, um, has funding for quiet zones. And so working with the um, US 36 coalition um, at our last meeting, um, which the mayor and I attend those, we also signed off on a funding split with the um, handful of cities that are in that, everybody that's really on the Northwest Corridor, um, to really allocate uh, those funds, how we would allocate funds to get funding for quiet zones. So we're working on a number of issues, including trying to get funding for it, as well as trying to get the rules changed so that it's less expensive to have to uh, install these quiet zones. Mm. Councilor Christensen. Uh, thank you, uh, Assistant City Manager Sean Lewis. Um, I, I, that's good to know that you're working on so many different things. Is the um, as I mentioned about a year ago, uh, Windsor got a grant. Was that through, uh, was that a federal grant or what kind of grant was that? Council Member uh, Christensen, that was a federal grant. Okay. Um, they are the only community in the nation that has oh. received a grant for um, <laughs> okay. quiet zones. And in fact, since then, um, the rules have changed for that particular funding source that I, I do not believe you can any longer apply for oh. quiet zone funds from that funding source. But again, we are applying for, um, uh, right now it looks like we'll uh, be asking for about a million dollars um, okay. from Dr. Cog for Longmont and then the other cities on the corridor um, um, we'll be asking for uh, amounts that are equivalent to the number of quiet zones that are required in the community. Mm -hmm. And I also wanted to fa uh, mention, I failed to, to point out that on Friday, we also got an email from Dan Betts, who, as you know, is with Corey Gardner's, uh, Senator Gardner's office, saying that he too has filed um, a legislation okay. with the new long-term transportation funding authorization bill, um, where he was able to include an amendment to the bill which would require the Government Accountability Office to study and report on the effectiveness of the 2006 Federal Rail, um, Railroad Administration's rule on train horn crossings. So again, just another legislative way that we are trying to kind of get at the need for changing that rule to make it more right. flexible. I, I was really, that's, it's really nice to hear about uh, the Fort Collins variance. I think that's a wonderful idea if that can go through because it might be more, much more cost effective. These are really expensive as we, we all know. So. Thank you for your work on that, both of you. And I think on the other pieces, um, as I've had conversations with Public Works and Natural Resource staff, we're also trying to fin identify other options that would assist us in, in, in accomplishing this goal. Um, we're still on um, in the preliminary look, and, and so as we're able to identify those, um, we will bring those to the council uh, to potentially consider. Councilmember Santos. Thank you, Mayor Coombs. And with the Dr. Cog funding, Sean, as you, you know, as you know, we're competing up against numerous other cities and counties for funding, and they all want quiet zones as well. So, it, you know, Councilmember uh, Christensen is not. We've continually tried to get uh, not only the state to help us, but uh, a rallying support to our federal. Um, uh, legislators in, in Washington, D.C., and so far, you know, uh, Senator Bennett, Senator Gardner, um, haven't heard too much from uh, Congressman Buck, but I know uh, Congressman Polis, is all, they've all been very uh, supportive of, of trying to get those rules reopened. And as you were, and as soon as I found out about Windsor as well, was like, where, where can we get this funding? And apparently it's just evaporated, um, uh, that, that no one else and I'll have to give uh, uh, the mayor of Windsor a hard time next time I see him. Is you know, he didn't share the wealth because if I'm not mistaken, they got three million dollars for, for for Windsor. Um, but it, this is something that you know, no residents are upset. Noise has gotten worse, but there's been really no mechanism just up until this last six or seven months to a year that funding has been, any source of funding has been available for uh, quiet zones. It's all been on the municipalities um, to, try to, to try to make these happen. And when budgets are tight, and although we may be approving a, a $306 million budget, people will say, well, that's a lot of money. You just put it t towards here. But as Jim indicated, there are several different funds that are allocated for certain different projects and trying to get everything done within a reasonable time, sometimes, uh, you can and sometimes you can't. 
So what I always tell folks is shop here, shop local. All your sales tax will come here, and perhaps we can get some of these, uh, check some of these boxes uh, of these uh, unfunded um, CIP projects. Councilmember Anderson. Thank you, Mayor. Um, the wind, uh, I don't know if this was a rumor, but I, I thought that the Windsor money was Tiger Fund money, which Dr. Cog, because it's an M, municipal planning organizations just gets the block of Tiger Fund money, and then everybody, like, dives in for scraps and chunks of meat. But um, so how was, um, yeah, I know it is. I've been there. I've seen that. Um, and then you've got, you know, the really big cities who bring really big sticks with, you know, nails in them, and, you know, it's like bludgeoning people down there. So why haven't we, I mean, if, if this is such a priority, um, I know we apply for Tiger Fund money like the Main Street Bridge was Tiger Fund money. Um, I thought, you know, the, what we got, and that was probably a couple of years ago from Dr. Cog, but um, why haven't we reprioritized some things when we're down at Dr. Cog? Um, to say, why don't we look uh, at, you know, quiet zone, zone stuff together um, as a priority of Dr. Cog to make that recommendation if we're all talking about the same stuff. So I think the bridge project, the, the grant we applied for was the FEMA 404, the hazard mitigation. The one before that. So I'm going to have to let I thought the one before sure. the flood was, was Tiger Fund money. Good evening, Mayor, Count, uh, Mayor Coombs, members of council. Uh, no, we have not applied for any Tiger Fund money for the Main Street Bridge. We applied. We talked to the state and Dr. Cog. They don't have any bridge fund money. So what we applied for was, as uh, city manager um, said, was FEMA money, and we received $3 million from FEMA for the combined Main Street and South Pratt Parkway Bridge as a hazard mitigation fund. But I thought we had the Main Street Bridge on the books to replace anyway. We did, and flood. it's using City of Longmont local funds oh, because local we did not get any not, state or okay, federal funds are available okay. for bridge, bridge okay. funds. All righty. Well, I just wanted to, you know, when we're talking about this, there's um, a lot of stuff in the CIP that's unfunded and a lot of stuff that's been on the CIP. Harold and I had a discussion just going through. There's stuff on the CIP that's like in the dead letter office that's been on there. I mean, the quiet zones have been on the CIP since 2008, which means in 2007, the council was talking about it. So I just, you know, we need to um, figure out what we're going to do if it's just, you know, kind of a, you know, a dream or we're going to have to take a look at the CIP as far as, you know, all the unfunded. I know you always give us the number of everything that's unfunded, and it's always huge. Councilmember Santos. Thank you, Mayor Coons. And, and Councilmember Loveson, I would agree. We have a lot of unfunded thing, uh, unfunded items on the CIP. We have the Twin Peaks uh, uh, golf course irrigation system that needs to be replaced. Uh, Ute, uh, Ute Creek as well. Uh, excuse me, Sunset as well. Um, many HVAC things that need to uh, need to be uh, replaced in, in the CIP. Uh, when we came to Tiger Grant, Sean, and correct me if I'm wrong, this last one we went for the uh, uh, the study of the BRT. If I'm not mistaken, um, uh, to help us along with trying to get fast tracks here into Longmont, so there are you know projects that come before council that we sign off on, that we send staff. Uh, staff goes to the the TAC uh, Transportation uh, uh, Advisory Committee at Dr. Cog, and it comes before the board. Of course, as you said, there's uh, um, just the stadium of doom trying to get uh, um, funding uh, each each municipality basically fighting for themselves although we're supposed to think regionally uh, and try to help each other out um, luckily we were able to at least get some tiger funding for the the study of the BRT on 119 and 287 um, and that was also through the uh, recommendation from Na uh, uh, NAMS to RTD um, which the funding goes through Dr. Cog so you know, it, it, when council is ready to uh, see about where we can get funding as, uh, for quiet zones or some of the other uh, unfunded CIP projects, again, shop local because it does help. Um, when you take money out of town, it, it doesn't stay here, and we can't uh, fund some of these projects we'd really like to fund. Sean, do you have? 
Does Mayor, he think correctly? Mayor Kims, no, I, I think you're correct in that. Um, I would mention that um, Windsor is actually not in Dr. Cog, so they're part of the North Front Range uh, MPO. Um, but I believe that they actually did apply for those um, funds directly um, as not part of the uh, North Front Range MPO. Um, but again, to my knowledge, this is, this is the first year that our MPO, our, which is also Dr. Cog, um, has made these funds available, um, which are actually connected to Fast Tracks. Um, but we do plan to um, uh, go for these. We think we have a better shot because we're working with multiple cities within the region. And there are a number of cities that have already received some funding um, in years past. Um, for instance, Denver and Arvada have both received um, some funds already for this. So there are going to be, there is a little less competition than there would be otherwise. Councilmember Levison. Thank you, Mayor. However, if the um, funding is really looking at the fast tracks related quiet zones, that doesn't really, you know, help um, alleviate the pain and suffering of 2.30 in the morning. Councilmember Santos. Well, it, it would, Councilmember Levison, to, to an extent, if we can leverage those other quiet zones throughout the city that we'll be using whenever we get commuter rail to Longmont, um, to be able to create those zones, you just can't have one where uh, where it's considered a quiet zone, and then the rest of them it, it won't work. In fact, I, I was reading the uh, rereading and uh, sent information to a resident who asked some information regarding quiet zones, and it was in the I'm trying to pull it up here the uh, August uh, transportation advisory board meeting. Uh, just because the one quiet zone may be created at first in uh, first in Maine doesn't necessarily mean that it's going to be a quiet zone because it's that quarter that quarter mile that they have to blow those horns, and if you're going to get it at one place, they're just going to go ahead and blow it because they don't there aren't any other quiet zones along the line. So if we can get start establishing and getting money for those lines along the fast tracks rail. Um, then we can perhaps take things, other things off the CIP to make it go through uh, between 3rd and uh, 66. Councilmember Bagley. Thank you, Mayor. Just very briefly, uh, it was presented to me by a citizen who just moved up here from Arizona, and they claimed that the city that they came from, uh, the FRA didn't like it, but what the city did was actually paid for automatic horns to be put in at the intersections so that they'd blow at the intersection, mm -hmm. and so that way it's focused on just the cars in the intersection rather than the entire street. Um, and so my question is simple, simply, is that possible? And then you program it to be the minimal decibel level for the shortest amount of time that the federal regs allow, and maybe that's a solution. Yes, Mr. Wilkins, members of the council. Those are called wayside horns, and they are one of the supplemental safety measures that you can use. What it does is it basically sounds the train horn right at the intersection, not a quarter mile in advance as it's coming towards it. Um, I've seen a demonstration of them. They are incredibly loud. Uh, they work very, very well in commercial areas where you're, you're trying to limit it to that commercial area, um, but putting one along Atwood Street, for example, uh, would be... Well, they won't care. <laughs> Uh, you know, but that is something. And the cost of a wayside horn installation can run as much as $500,000. Uh, when we, we looked at those as part of the study. So you still need to have all of the other items that are included in a supplemental safety measure in order to do that. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Councilmember Levison. Thank you. So I just want to point out for Council's edification that um, under the Phase 7 for the Quiet Zones Unfunded, CIP, it says Hover, Sunset, Terry, and Kaufman with a notation in the paragraph that those actually are not counted because those would be part of Fast Tracks RTD. So we actually don't have those in the calculation right now. Those are just noted as a phase that is going to be paid by somebody else. Okay, I think I'm going to open up the public hearing on this item at this point. So the first person on the list for uh, the uh, proposed 2016 uh, operating budget is Steve Hansforce. Hanford. 
Hansford. Okay. Okay. And then uh, Mike Barwell is next. Nice to meet everyone. <clears throat> uh, I live at uh, Mike Barnwell. I live at 346 Baker. Um, bi uh, moved here last year after spending a, a year in Boulder from Atlanta. I live with my wife, Jennifer. Um, <clears throat> you know, the thing that we've noticed is the, how loud the horns are, um, and it seems to be getting more frequent from what, from what I can tell. From the, the Times Call article that was in Sunday, um, <clears throat> the numbers from last year's, it looks like they've increased 59%. Um, they noted harvest time as a, as a, a reason that that's uh, increased. Also a spike in, I think, coal, moving coal around. Um, <clears throat> but from what I understand, uh, one of the main drivers of rail traffic is fuel prices. So when fuel prices go up, you know, more people want to ship rail. And with fuel prices being so low right now, then it just seems like it's going to go up even more. So. Uh, I'm worried about that trend getting worse and worse. From what I can tell, there's about a train every hour or more. I mean, I'm th I think it's close to 20 a day. Uh, and it's very loud from what the, the presentation that uh, Nick put together in 2010, I think, uh, it's about 90 decibels. We're in there, we're about a block and a half from the, uh, the rail. Uh, it's very loud. I work from home. <clears throat> I'm on conference calls all day long pretty much. I'm always muting. I'm muting myself. <laughs> Hang on, I'll be right back. Ank. It's 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 uh, it's crazy. So my first point is I think the frequency is increasing. So there's a lot of people that say, oh, the train's great. You know, been here for a long time. Whatever. It's getting to the point where it's getting it's getting out of hand. I think. Um, the other thing is I think the impact is is changing. People like me that work from home. I think there's going to be more of us living in the city. I think I, I was just talking to one of my neighbors before coming here, and she said that. Um, her, her young daughter, um, you know, goes into a fit when the trains come. That when they're at the playground, all the kids hold their ears. Um, one of the moms said they're moving because of the trains. So it's become an issue, becoming an issue more and more and more. So I just want, I, I know about the, you know, I've read all the stuff about the SIP and, 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 and you've got all these doctors and tigers and all this stuff and that's great. Um, <laughs> I don't think this increases because of the, the engineer who's mad at his ex-wife or whatever. I think it's real. I think it's going to continue. Um, and I really just want to emphasize, let's do something about it. I mean, I'm proud to be in Longmont. I, I, I like the, the progressive nature of the city, the, the internet, the, all of that stuff. Let's do something progressive and find a way to solve this problem because for a lot of us right there by the tracks, it's really painful. It really impacts quality of life. Thanks so much. Thank you. Ma Mary Lynn? No, no, no clapping, please. Yeah, I mean, basically at the end, I'll say anybody not on this list will be welcome to come up and speak. So, uh, Mary Lynn? Good evening. It's come to my attention uh, in the last couple days, speaking to my neighbors who've been doing research on this issue, that what we intuitively feel is actually true. Excessive noise, especially at unexpected intervals, is a public health hazard. This is actually as or more damaging in some ways um, than particulate matter in the air. This is something that is significantly affecting the health of the many, many young children who have very sensitive and developing hearing, um, the, uh, who are at the schools during the day, very close to the tracks. Um, it makes it difficult for them to concentrate. It's not good for them. And it certainly is not um, healthy and helpful to people who are trying to get a good night's sleep. Um, today, we were trying to count, and we lost count on the trains at about 20. There are a lot of trains. There is a lot of repeated noise. This is not something that is conducive to the health and stability of a neighborhood, and we're asking you, we're urging you to look at the ways in which you can prioritize funds to really work on this issue. Thank you. Rick Jacoby. Well, uh, Rick Jacoby, 419 Collier Street. Uh, thank you for hearing me out a second time this month. Um, I think when I addressed this issue of quiet zones two weeks ago, 
I touched a raw nerve in my neighborhood. Never have I had so many emails from so many neighbors, many of which I didn't know yet, uh, all voicing their support and asking what they can do. And as you can see, some of them are here. Uh, they didn't all sign up to speak. I didn't want them all to speak, but they asked what they could do. I said, you could come down and just show your support by being here. And it's hard for them to sit through mind-numbing accounting to do this. Um, but I mean, I think it shows some, and this is a small fraction of who wants to be here. We're all very busy. And I think you should extrapolate that and think about that. There's a lot of people in this city who are very motivated to get something changed. Um, could, could you see a show of hands? How many people are here just for the trains? And I just was speaking to them in the last week, okay? Um, I want to thank Councilman Santos and Moore um, for their prompt responses and for your uh, emails uh, pointing me in the direction, uh, Dr., uh, Mr. Santos pointed me in the direction of the updated 2015 information given to the Transportation Advisory Board by the city this summer. That data included city-sponsored survey that showed that a majority of Longmonters feel trains uh, sounding their horns is a big problem for Longmont. Over 12,000 taxpayers in your survey feel it's a major problem, and it's getting worse. Uh, the paper, as it was mentioned, it said 50 to 87 percent increase in the last year alone of trains. Um, but unfortunately, by doing nothing about this growing issue, as we've been doing, uh, talking about it, thinking about it, writing about it, but doing nothing about it, the cost of mitigating trains also appears to be growing with a noise. The time to do something about it is now. Is there anything in the capital improvement plan books that has sat there unfunded for longer than this? Does anybody know? I can't imagine. Mm -hmm. Well, that's, that's remarkable. <laughs> Quieting trains per se isn't controversial. The problem is expense. I should mention that the accounting for the quiet zone costs is not up to par. When I was looking at the numbers, it makes them look more expensive than they would actually be. The Emory Street and First Avenue improvements are listed in the quiet zone project T94 for the quiet zones as costing $520,000 for directional horns. But that intersection is already funded and being built under separate project T127. T127 says it'll cost the city $1 million but I'm being told that it's going to cost the city only $500,000 and the developer will pay the rest. I just took $1,020,000 out of the apparent cost of quiet zones. This has to be looked at closer. Um, I realize it's probably too late to change the 2016 budget, but I would ask you to consider funding quiet zones somehow in 2017. Councilwoman Finley even said at last night's debate, we've always been creative in finding funding oh, for infrastructure. I'm sorry, but your three minutes is up. So. Um, I don't believe I timed this. It's, there's a little bit. If I could please finish just a little bit more. I, I've asked a lot of these folks not to speak, and I just have a little bit more. If it's all right with you. Okay, okay go ahead and finish. Right. Thank you. I don't think everyone wants to speak. Um, by, so... Uh, with an annual budget of $300 million, $300 million and revenue growing by $3 million this year alone, you cannot tell me that the city can't fund this. By doing nothing, you would be telling me, telling my neighbors, and telling the city that you don't want to do something about this. But according to the city's own surveys, close to 47,000 taxpayers see train noise as a problem to be dealt with, as a pr and the problem has, has gone um, so far just ignored. So uh, I should also mention real briefly that um, the 2015 update on the quiet zone plan also has a different priority for uh, phasing in quiet zones. I would suggest that you use your standard of priority-based funding, which would make the historic east side the obvious place to start these improvements because of both the housing density and the horn density, the train intersections. In closing, I would request that City Council make a motion to move Capital Improvement Project T94, Railroad Quiet Zones, from the unfunded to the partly funded category. To uh, start implementation with the area most impacted by the BNSF horns, 3rd Avenue to 9th Avenue, and to direct staff to start improvements no later than 2017, giving you a year to work on the budget with this, and completing the funding of this segment no later than 2021. And thank you for allowing me to run over. No clapping, please. Um, Michelle, maybe? Okay. Uh, 
Wendy uh, Gronbeck. No, this this is the uh, public hearing. No, there's not. No. Yeah, it's study session. So, yeah. Um, so. Okay. You, you got to come up here. You got to state your name and address. Wendy Gronbeck, um, live at 210 4th Avenue. I got a good view of the train, uh, 50 feet, 110 decibels on my phone decibel app. I did not move to Longmont four years ago for a great irrigation system in the golf course. It was because of the historic district and the quality of life here. Okay. Um, but the train whistles, if it's 20 trains a day between 3rd Avenue and Mountain View, that's 300 blasts just to give it some perspective. Every day, 300 blasts. So it just put those numbers into what Rick said. And uh, Marka? Hello, I'm Ann Macca. I live at 404 Baker Street. Um, we have been there for about four and a half years. We love our house, we love our neighborhood. We're about one block from the train. And if you always keep your windows closed, it's not so bad. But think about what that says about our neighborhood and about how we kind of have to feel about being outside and about seeing each other. Um, other people have mentioned the frequency of the trains increasing. I know neighbors who are leaving because of it. Um, and I think that that really impacts the health of our neighborhood. Um, people who can leave will leave. People who can't leave will be stuck. Uh, Columbine Elementary, which is two blocks from our house, would be a great place to send our child, but why would we? Why would we send a kid there when they're going to have to fight learning with train noise all day long and try and figure out how to negotiate that? Um, and I think that that says something really sad for Columbine as well, that that's going to be a school where kids who are stuck there will stay there, and kids who have opportunities to leave will go to other schools within the district. Um, so I, too, hope that this doesn't have to stay on the uh, list of unfunded projects, but I know that budgets are challenging and that we're doing our best. So thank you for hearing us and thank you for trying to plan and make it work. Thank you. D Darren Maka. Um, hello, my name is Darren Mack. I live at 404 ba Baker Street. Um, and uh, I mean, I agree with pretty much everything that's being said against the train noise. Um, another thing I haven't heard mentioned, and it's probably been mentioned before, but is uh, people racing through the neighborhoods to try and beat the trains. Uh, it's really, I work from home as well, so I deal with it all day. And um, I do notice, you know, I hear the, the engines racing and people just booking through, trying to make it across those tracks. And uh, I'm just waiting for something bad to happen. Um, and then there's also all the, uh, the uh, economic devaluation of the whole area because of the trains, the traffic, you know, the blocking of all the streets. Um, so, again, I mean, I, I actually love trains, <laughs> but uh, I've, I'm getting sick of the noise, and uh, it is uh, quite a distraction from just, you know, living your life. So, thank you. Thank you. Is there anyone else in the audience who would like to speak on this public hearing item at this point? Uh, Mayor and City Council, my name is Joseph Brenna. I'm at 516 Collier Street. So first I want to say that actually I'm gratified to hear that the efforts that city staff is making and the many different avenues that you're going at to, to try to look at every way to deal with this issue, whether it's through legislation or whether it's through its grant funding. Um, but what I'll say is given the budget, the, uh, the millions of dollars that's going to take to completely uh, address this issue, um, even if those efforts are successful, from what I'm hearing, we're not going to come close to being able to, to do this through the kind of funding that's available. And the changes in legislation, I think, are very uncertain. So we've been waiting for a very long time for this to happen, 
And uh, it doesn't sound to me like waiting any longer is going to make it happen. It sounds like the city of Longmont, we are going to need to find the funding if we want this to change. If not, we can go through these efforts and we may get a little money here and someday we may get a change in legislation. But I think if we stay on our current path, we're going to be, look, we're going to be talking about this issue for another nine years or ten years. So I don't think that that, that approach is, is, is helpful. I think we've got to pull ourselves up by our own bootstraps on this. Um, what I want to read about is this. Uh, I reviewed the um, 2010 presentation here. And um, it was said that, you know, it's hard to really quantify what's the impact of train noise. And there's a lot of comment here. I think everybody understands that it's irritating to people here. But in 2011, the World Health Organization actually uh, did a study on this. And this article that I'm reading from <clears throat> is from the uh, magazine of the American Psychological Association. So according to the World Health Organization study in 2011, there's overwhelming evidence that exposure to environmental noise has adverse effects on the health of the population, citing children as particularly vulnerable to the effects of chronic urban and suburban racket. They're particularly citing train horns blaring. Um, and of course they say this may not only be annoying, it might actually be deadly. Their report shows that it leads to higher blood pressure and more fatal heart attacks. But what I'm more concerned about here is that um, children exposed to households and classrooms near this level of noise are, uh, have been shown in studies to be slower in their development of cognitive and language skills and have lower reading scores. There are lifelong effects from this that uh, cannot be made up later on. The study suggests that noise exposed children may be less sensitive to speech even though their hearing was unimpaired. And the authors of the study uh, think this is happening because children who are exposed to noise develop a stress response uh, of ignoring the noise but also uh, ignoring speech. So they're not only ignoring the stimuli that are harmful, but also the, the stimuli that they need to pay attention to. What I'd like to say is that this is a public health and safety issue. And it, I think it's impacting the residents of Longmont and particularly the children of Longmont. I think it's a serious issue and I don't think waiting for grants or legislation to change is going to be effective. I think we need to find the money in our budget, and I think we need to make it a priority. Thank you for listening. Okay, is there anybody else who'd like to speak on the budget here? Uh, my name is Marco Morelli. I live at 409 Baker Street. And um, I'm here with my neighbors in uh, support of uh, uh, our hope to uh, manage somehow the effect, the, the, the negative effects of the trains on our neighborhood and uh, on our families and on ourselves. Uh, I have a two-year-old daughter. I have a six-year-old and a two-year-old. My two-year-old, uh, she cries when she hears the train noise. If, if we're not around, uh, she'll come crying to us and she wants to hide un under the covers and uh, stuff like that. So it's, it's, a, it's a real thing. We've been here since 2006 and um, you know, I, I, one would think that you'd get used to it. Uh, and I know anecdotally, uh, anecdotally at least, that, um, that train noise has increased uh, due to, you know, these federal regulations and train traffic has increased uh, since then. Uh, but what I've found is that you don't actually get used to it. There's a cumulative sort of effect. And it's this kind of low-level trauma that kind of builds, I think. And, and that's why we're all here is because it's, uh, it's this cumulative uh, exasperation, I think, that we all feel. Uh, and so I'm fully in support of uh, quiet, quiet zones. I, I really hope you guys can do something about it. And I appreciate the efforts that uh, are already, already underway. Um, I want to add to it, though. I want to go kind of a little bit more radical. And that's that there are other problems with having trains in, in our city. Uh, there's an economic cost, for sure, uh, which has already been um, mentioned. Uh, there is um, a safety issue. Uh, there was a series of articles in the Boulder Weekly last summer uh, talking about oil trains, uh, these uh, very dangerous trains, which if they were to derail, if there's a spill, it could be devastating. Uh, there was a town in 
uh, Canada that had a square mile blown up uh, by, a, by an oil train that de derailed. Uh, there have been numerous other uh, derailments and spills causing a lot of damage, including in Colorado, including in the recent past and just the last few months, uh, a little bit north of here. And so I think that there's an opportunity uh, to, for a regional approach where cities are working together with the state and with BNSF. My understanding is they have tracks out east that could be used if there was a coordination and if there was a kind of win-win uh, for everybody involved. And so in addition to pushing on the noise issue, I think that there should be some bigger picture thinking and look at the train issue as a whole. What is the economic opportunity? Uh, if, Of course it's going to be usually expensive to move train tracks, uh, but there are tracks out there. There is an economic opportunity that could pay for that expense. Uh, and we would certainly gain in safety, we would gain in quality of life, and we would gain in um, you know, the, uh, the um, uh, you know, um, the health and quality of our city. So thank you very much. Thank you. All right. Anybody else would like to speak on the public hearing item tonight? Jeff Thompson, 1616 Sumner Street. Um, I did not come to speak at this hearing to you, Mayor Coombs, or the city council members, I came to speak to people who care about Longmont. So I'm really glad there are all these people that are concerned about the train noise so I can speak to them. Jim Golden and Harold Dominguez are still lying to the people of Longmont about the proposed 2016 budget. Because I came here last week and raised hell, he confessed that the numbers he shows for the 2014 or to, for the 2015 budget this year, he confessed that they are 160 million dollars low. So what he proposed in the budget. 160 million, about 160 million dollars disappeared. That there's no way that is going to still be spent this year. Nobody does, no legitimate organization does budgeting without looking at what they're going to spend in the current year. There's less than three months left. If these dishonest people wanted to take an honest look at what kind of money is available for next year, they would be giving you a very accurate estimate of what the actual expenditures are going to be in 2015, and that's nowhere in the budget document. They're hiding that from us because they know there's an extra $160 million to be spent next year. He admitted that they hid $160 million at the tail end of his talk, which was all lies, except when he made the admission. But the significance of that is that it won't be spent this year. It will be available next year. The next item on the agenda about extraterritorial water service, what these liars want to spend the money on is providing treated water service to all these southwest weld cities. That's what Brian Bagley's goofball plan is. It's next up on the agenda. And the reason they're hiding the 160 million, the train problem, the, the train, the company that owns the train told us about, told us at least within the last 10 years they could fix the problem for five million, and you got 160 million you're hiding. See, I also would like to speak on the, this public hearing. Mayor and Council of Gordon Pedro, 2639 Falcon Drive. Thank you for this uh, 
arduous task you have of allocating our scarce resources over a broad range of needs that the community has. As you've heard tonight, we always have more needs and more wants than we have resources to address. And for that reason, somebody has to make the tough decisions about what's going to go this year versus a future year. So for that, uh, I want to thank you for your hard work. And although I have not spent hours looking at these budget uh, numbers in detail, they seem reasonable to me. And I think that uh, uh, relying on uh, the staff to follow your directions, you're getting a proposed budget that makes sense for our community. I want to specifically thank you for looking at affordable housing and listening to citizens who have been before you for the last several months talking about this issue and recognizing that as a priority and having $500,000 in this budget for 2016 for the affordable housing fund. Uh, looking at the newspaper this morning, reporting on the council forum last night, as the candidates all had a chance to uh, discuss issues, it appears as affordable housing is going to be an issue long into the future for other councils to continue to deal with. But this is a good first step, and I want to thank you for that. Thank you for continuing to keep this community a place where we all want to live and work, although we certainly have issues and challenges such as train noises. And I want to finally say I think the community owes a big thank you to Jim Golden and his staff, but particularly to Jim. He spent years coming before city councils, bringing complex issues, uh, big budget, yes, 306 million is a big budget. That's a lot of money. But it's no, very few people in this room recognize that the revenue coming in to support that is in probably 50 different funds, much of it allocated to very specific projects that cannot be spread to others. And unless you understand those details, you don't really appreciate the job that the budget staff and Jim has. So thank you all for good work. Thank you. Is there anybody else that would like to speak at this public hearing at this time? And the, what we're talking about is just this particular item. It's not uh, It's a budget item. All right, seeing no one, I'm going to close the public hearing. Councilman Santos. Thank you, Mayor Coombs. Um, I was going to wait for people to file out, but okay. Um, no, I just wanted to, uh, again, as uh, Gordon mentioned, and he was here for 19 years and saw many of these budgets come forward. Uh, uh, again, a big thanks to Jim and his staff um, for uh, making this budget process over the last uh, several years that I've been on council at least an easy one, and if I've, if I've had questions, to be able to call them and ask them questions about the budget and how it all, how all the funds work. And, and as it was mentioned, we do have specific funds that can't be moved. You can't use uh, Longmont Power and Communication funds for street funds. So there's things of that nature. So I, I just and um, just to dispel, there's not 126 million dollars missing, um, as it was explained. Uh, we do go through uh, supplemental appropriations throughout the year, a lot of flood work, a lot of carryover from, from 2014 to 2015. We'll have carryover from 15 into 16. Um, but uh, I, I appreciate uh, the, wor the work that, uh, again, staff has done. I would encourage those residents that have stayed that, uh, you know, we have been, uh, again, uh, it's not that we're just talking about it. We're actually, every time that... We've gone to Washington, D.C. to talk to our uh, congressional delegation or whether they're in town or their staff is in town. We hit them up on, on, on train noise all the time. But I would also encourage you, the, the voters of, of, federal, of our federal delegation, to send letters and emails to those folks as well to help us try to get these implemented. Um, I know there's others that want to talk, but... Um, I won't make the motion to move the budget because I, I think it's we have a, a sound operating budget with cost savings that I appreciate uh, what, what Harold and, and his staff has, has done in going through the budget committee as well as the other department heads, Eugene, you as well. Um, and uh, I appreciate all the hard work in trying to find efficiencies and ways to save taxpayer dollars. I, I really do appreciate it. 
And there are others that like to speak, so, but I'll tell you what, I, I will move the 2016 budget. Second. As presented. Okay. It's been moved and second. Councilman Levison. Thank you. Um, Harold and I had a discussion this afternoon, and, you know, I think that with uh, some of the analysis that we saw from the recent presentation at the Transportation Advisory Board, um, I think we need to do a little bit of amendments to the CIP um, on T127 um, as presented to us. It doesn't actually reflect the um, contribution from the developer. And if you look at some of the other items in the CIP, like for example, the CIP on missing sidewalks, there's a clear statement that when the sidewalks are put in, the costs are going to be tracked and then any development that comes along, the developers will contribute to uh, reimburse the city for laying out the infrastructure. So my suggestion is that, you know, maybe we add that because otherwise it looks like the whole million dollars comes out of the street fund. And then also um, to look at adding the other, another CIP um, related which uh, right now there's just the T92 Boston Avenue, but I would suggest that we add T94 railroad quiet zones to that. And then, um, do you want to, I guess, yeah, I mean, Nick's shaking his head no, but I don't understand why you would do that because that is a contributing um, CIP. And then I'd like to really take a look at the railroad quiet zone T94 and um, see if we can't accommodate some part of a budget um, 2017 and on. I know that we'll look, the, the council will look at the 2017 budget in 2016, but at least that gives an aspiration that we're gonna fund something. And I, I really need, I really think we need to do that. Um, you know, Jim talked about the priority-based budgeting and one of our priorities is a healthy and safe community. Um, we know that Columbine Elementary School has kids that are below, well below the poverty line. And so does this train noise exacerbate the learning challenges these children already have? And the two of the intersections are right bookending the school. It is unbelievably loud. And when those kids are in the schoolyard, what effect is that having on their um, their hearing and also their in, inside the classroom the ability to learn? So I think if we're looking at priority-based budgeting, the railroad quiet zones at least deserves to have um, a bone, if you will, thrown on it uh, to look at something in uh, 17, 18, 19, and 20. So I, I'm not going to vote for the budget as it is. Um, I'd like to see us have a discussion about information presented to us. Councilmember Christensen. Uh, I wanted to thank Jim for taking the time to explain um, carryovers, which is something we do with our personal budgets, and but something I thought really added to the discussion and was, I thought would. Uh, take care of the discussion we had last week, but apparently not. But anyway, I, I think that's very valuable for to remind both us and um, the public about that carryover from year to year, which is an important amount of flexibility and it's something that everybody does, but thank you. Council Member Bagley. Thank you, Mayor Coombs. Um, just uh, addressing some of the comments, uh, first of all, uh, the comment was made that uh, who in their right mind would do that in a budget? Uh, first of all, congratulations, 300 plus million dollars. That is a very large organization to be responsible for as CFO, whether it's a city, public entity, nonprofit, you, you need skills. So thank you. You've done a great job, Mr. Golden. Um, and the difference between the city or a municipality and another organization is that unlike the private sector, we can say we're going to spend money and it's a multi-year project, but if the following year's council does not approve the funds, nothing happens. And so it's a natural consequence of having this type of entity uh, uh, in operation. So um, 
Uh, I echo Councilmember Santos's comments that there's no money missing, and it was uh, clearly spelled out tonight from from Mr. Golden. Um, uh, I moved to Longmont in 1999, lived next to a uh, block away from the trains up until December 18th of last year. Um, my heart goes out to those who <laughs> still still remain. Um, the good news is that Harold Dominguez has moved into a neighborhood that you're pretty close to train noise now, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so I'm, I'm guessing that that will become a more frequent uh, topic that might appear on future council agendas. So uh, uh, let us know how that works out for you, Harold. And then, um, but uh, yeah, I, I, I took notes. I, I think that the big takeaway is that, I mean, it would be really tempting, and I've not heard it said, and nor am I going to start saying, well, you should have not moved next to, there's flies up here. You should have not moved next to the tracks, because the reality is when you have enough people starting to get bugged by something that was previously here, and we have the funds and the will and the way and the resources, we should start dealing with it. So uh, uh, I think, I don't speak for council, I'm just one of seven, but I, and I, I'm pretty sure we all heard that basically what the, the takeaway was, you know, there's a lot of noise caused by trains. Please do something about it as soon as possible. And so, uh, uh, and the reason I asked my question before was to make sure that everybody heard that, you know, before the stones and pitchforks came out, that we actually, I mean, it's been an ongoing discussion for the last couple of months, and uh, we need to approve the budget. I'm going to vote for it. But that doesn't mean that it, we're dealing with it. We'll figure something out. Don't know if it's going to be in a week or a month or a year, but staff's on it, and it's it's. I would say that it's a priority. Well, I think when you start talking about you know health and kids, particularly children's health, it, it does kind of amp up the uh, intensity. Um, you know, I think we have to approve our, our budget, um, but you know, I think we we have time next year that maybe we should figure out a way to, to raise the, the, the level um, and, and make this more of a, you know, maybe a, I know you can't have your whole quiet zone implemented until you've got like nine crossings, which is a problem, but maybe we got to tackle them one or two at a time until we actually get nine crossings done and then, then it all becomes, but until you, you, you do all, all nine crossings, you really don't have a quiet zone, so. Councilmember Santos. Thank you, Rick, and it would be good. It we meet with the school district next week, is that correct? 21st? 21st. 20th, 21st. Two weeks. C can we put on whether and how Columbine is affected by the, the train noise? At least the question, have they heard anything so they can report back to us? Yeah. Um, you okay? No, no, you said have they heard anything, and I found that well. funny. <laughs> well, I mean, well, what I mean is that has, has the school board... It, it was it, sometimes I, I I crack it you know occasionally crack a joke I'm not like Councilmember Bagley, but uh, who cracks the good jokes, but um, uh, but it, it might be something has the board has uh, the superintendent heard from parents or the school about that particular topic of, of train noise. Right. Do you want to respond to that? Well, what I can do is um, I know that agenda has several topics that okay. um, may lead to lengthy conversations, but I'll definitely relay that okay. to, to the superintendent and, and we can get some information on that. But there, there are uh, several lengthy conversations for that discussion. And, and I apologize to Councilmember Moore, his, his light's on, and I'll, I'll get off just one second, is that you know, once this uh, budget is approved, uh, perhaps the council should again send this to transportation staff and, and the Transportation Advisory Board to take a, another look to update the 2017 to 2023 CIP um, with uh, some of the modifications that were talked to tonight. The way that it is now, it, it, it seems to be correct for this, year, for this coming year. Council Member Moore. Thank you, Mayor Coombs. Um, <clears throat> my opinions, obviously, here, but I think what we're seeing here is a, an example of how the federal government actually applies one rule to fit all situations. Our trains don't go through town at 50 miles an hour like they do in a lot of communities. Um, <clears throat> so to have them having to hit their horn a quarter mile before they get the intersection and the gate, you know, they don't show up for another 45 seconds to a minute, 
I think that is, is indicative of how that rule is really not well, well thought through. Um, I think you could make, I mean, there are people in Longmont would think the, um, the FAA has the same problem with the airport issues and the noise that Mile High Skydiving is producing and how we don't have any local control over, uh, over that. And a one-size-fits-all rule is really the way they approach everything. And so I think we have our, our fathers in the federal land that uh, really just don't understand the day-to-day -day lives of people, and that's how they come up with these rules. And, and once they're in place, they, they just don't change. So it's, I think this is kind of an example of what we're seeing here. Um, and as I've communicated to a few people, every time I'm in D.C., whether it be for Infrastructure Week with NLC or whether we're visiting our congressional de delegation or meeting with uh, FRA, it is a topic that we do discuss. Um, to make even small changes, r opening a rule is a big deal. T it takes a year or two years. And uh, unfortunately, the cost is always pushed down to the people that live in the community so um, that's kind of that one-size-fits-all rule just doesn't work in every pla every situation and there's really not much that's going to really happen in the next year or two from the federal government on any of this stuff so um, we'll have to just continue to work at seeing what we can do to come up with our own funding Councilmember Levison I think Carol's one. Oh, go ahead. Um, so, you know, I, I think that passing the CIP as is, um, we are actually passing a CIP that, especially on T94, that is totally erroneous because it still shows Phase 6 having Emory Street crossing as unfunded, yet we are funding Emory Street. Um, and Phase 7, the Hover, Sunset, and Terry, Looks like it's part of a phase of the project. Um, and uh, and then also, you know, phase one, it shows 119 in Ken Pratt Boulevard as unfunded, but um, we also have a notation that fast tracks would cover that. So at the very least, we need to update the accuracy of this and then also have uh, T127 um, accurate to reflect that the, there will be half the funds um, being paid for by the developer. Otherwise, it appears, again, that street fund is paying for everything. And if it's a contractual obligation, I think we should reflect it. So for accuracy, um, I hope we can make an amendment. I will let you all, I will let you all um, if you want, discuss that issue. I know that... Uh, Nick has, based on the conversation that council had last week on this issue, has uh, submitted um, an updated CIP on this issue. D it didn't include all of that, um, but we, we have recognized some of the issues, so council can discuss that. So we can actually update CIPs even if we approve the budget? Well, you're giving us direction tonight on the budget. We have to bring all of those budget items back to you at, right. in a regular meeting for you all to approve it via the ordinances so um, the, tonight right. is direction on the budget okay what we need to include in those documents councilmember santos thank you mr Kim, as well I, I just moved the budget i didn't move cip um there's there are two different items so but but i mean i can move both with an updated information to come back to council for the uh when we uh, take up the ordinances on first reading so and that will come ne next week or two weeks um, next week's when we start, as we indicated in an email, the packets actually, we're waiting on getting you the packet right. tomorrow based on your direction It's on our direction today. tonight. So, you know, I, again, I, I move the budget with the CIP, with the, the updated information that Nick will provide to council. That's, is that okay with the second? Yes. Okay. And with that, just one thing, uh, Mayor Coombs, is that if there's questions regard it, uh, regarding that item, we, we, should, we can discuss those on first reading. In, uh, on the consent agenda. Am I yeah. correct on that too? Right. Okay, yeah. thank you. Okay, we've got a motion. It's been seconded. Let's vote.
Okay, that passes seven to zero. Uh, Mayor Council, on the uh, on, on the budget, I did before we, Jim. Did you get everything you needed? Um, I, I did also want to point out a couple of things. So one of the one of the things that you know, as time goes by, uh, the more time that goes by, sometimes you um, lose track of some of the issues that really impact an organization's budget. Um, I would say that when we went into the recession of 08, I wasn't here. Um, but I was experiencing that at, in another community, and, and that significantly impacted the the overall budget of the organization. So if you know, sales tax actually contributes to the street fund. And, and so basically, a number of our funds were actually pressed during that time period because of the financial condition that we were going through um, as a result of the economic crisis that we faced really as a world during that time frame. Um, one of the things that also developed, and the council will know, is that we we brought to you about three years ago, um, we talked about a budget gap that we were trying to deal with. And that budget gap was in the neighborhood of three and a half million. Jim, three and a half million? Yeah. Three million, three million. We, we added things to it as we were going. And, and so one of the things that we've been particularly focused on in, in, in the last three budgets was actually making uh, a, a dent in that budget gap that we talked to you about. Um, today, I think that that budget gap is going to be in the neighborhood of four hundred and fifty thousand um, dollars. The biggest, the biggest piece that we really did it, this year is actually, and again, this is more of a reminder of previous conversations. Um, we, as an organization, reset the percentage that was allocated to the operating fund um, and the public improvement fund. Um, we know we have a lot of work left. We have a lot of infrastructure issues. Um, definitely heard what was said, and as I indicated earlier, I have asked staff to look into this. Um, I think the next piece, is, as we talked about some of the budget challenges, is really working on on uh, the capital improvements um, and, and looking at that as we continue to move forward. So that's definitely, at least on my list, a major issue um, as we tackle other budget challenges in the future. Thank you. Let's take a five minute break.
continue our meeting so staff can get home sometime tonight. Let's let's start a meeting, please. Mayor, the next item on your agenda is an item regarding extraterritorial, not extraterrestrial, water <laughs> service policies. Dale Rademacher. Extraterrestrial. Uh, thank you, Don, for that introduction. Water on Mars. Dale Rademacher, uh, General Manager for Public Works and Natural Resources, and with me tonight is Ken Houston, our Water Resources Manager. Uh, tonight we wanted to uh, um, really have a conversation with council about the variety of uh, codes and policies that are already in place uh, uh, here in Longmont that uh, address the issue of the provision of water service outside our city limits. Uh, council asked staff to take a look at that issue and uh, earlier in the year uh, we've done that um, and uh, tonight we want to report on that. We also. Uh, presented this information uh, to the Longmont Water Board at their September 21st meeting. At that point, uh, the Water Board did feel that the uh, overall policies are sufficient with the possible exception of looking at uh, the issue of exchanges. And Ken is going to talk with you a little bit about that. I uh, wasn't able to attend that Water Board meeting, but uh, Ken was there and, and he will certainly update you on that. Um, what I'd like to do is just go through uh, quickly through the communication, both for the council and for the public's uh, information on, on really how, how do we deal with the provision of water service outside our city. And so the first one is uh, item number one under the background and issue analysis. That deals with the outright sale of water uh, rights um, by Longmont. And that is in your charter uh, in, in section 13.2 uh, of the charter that uh, essentially says a sale of water rights uh, is, is uh, only approved subject to uh, the vote of the people. And so um, council, that's not something that we all can do. That's something that we go to the voters on. The only time I'm aware of us going to the voters uh, on that particular type of issue was in the early 1990s. And that's when we, some of you may recall, we brought the issue forward regarding the sale of a portion of our Windy Gap units um, that sort of failed miserably at the ballot. Um, lots of reasons why it maybe failed, but suffice it to say, uh, the voters in Longmont, I think, sent a pretty clear message then that they weren't real interested in that. That's not to say that this council or a future council could not place that issue before the, the voters in the future, but I, I would think it would need to be very thoughtful and, and thought out um, to do that. Any questions on that, on the sale of water? That's pretty clear for everybody? Okay. No, there is water. There is water. The, yeah, the, um, the second is for long-term water supply agreements. And um, we do have a couple of those uh, long-term water supply agreements. Um, you know, the one that uh, comes to mind for me is an agreement that we have with uh, Piesco, with Excel Energy. Uh, that was an agreement that we entered into uh, years ago that um, contemplated or agreed to a, um, a long-term water supply agreement. I believe it's a 75-year term, so it's a fairly long-term agreement, but uh, it's worked very well for the city. Uh, essentially what happens is uh, Excel Energy provides to us Colorado Big Thompson units that we can uh, take to our treatment plants and deliver to our customers, and in lieu of that we deliver to them uh, water from our wastewater treatment plant or from Union Reservoir, water that we cannot take directly into our treatment plant. So it's an exchange that works very well for a uh, public service company. It's, it's primarily for the Fort St. Vrain power plant. And um, we have a very good working relationship with Excel and I think that's an, an example of a long-term agreement that I think has benefited the city. Um, again, these are agreements that the council can enter into. Um, uh, you, you have the ability by your charter and your code to do that. 
they are very far and few between and uh, take a, a huge amount of scrutiny and, and public uh, uh, review before we ever uh, would um, enter into those and bring those forward for your consideration. There's none pending right now, um, but if there were, again, that would be a council decision uh, and, and you would have to uh, make a finding that, that, you know, that that's uh, in the interest of the city to do. And again, those that can only be answered. Council Member Levison. Thank you, Mayor. Um, Dale, I just want to know, it, has there ever been a time where we've done a water um, supply agreement or an exchange where it's been unequal amounts of, you know, gallons or shares? That one share, one group of shares, maybe 50 shares of this type of water is actually worth 75 shares of another. Like currency exchange, you know? Correct. So um, Mayor Combs and Council Member Levison, we've done a, a couple in the past. Um, one was with the uh, town of Erie, uh, I think it was a five-year term, and that was um, for the lease. It was really not a long-term water supply. It was a lease of uh, Windy Gap units to the town of Erie um, for cash. And it were, they were excess units that we knew in the next five years, in that five-year time period, were not going to be needed for the city's water supply. And we leased those to the town of Erie. That was, um, uh, I, it was equal in the form of the cash value of what we leased it for, but that was not a water-for-water water exchange. The Piesco agreement, for instance, what we looked at there was the, uh, the, uh, the firm yield of those water rights. You always want to look at what the, water is going to yield in a dry year. You don't really care what it's going to yield in a wet year because you got more water than you need. And so when you enter into those agreements, what, what's important to focus on is what is the parity of these two water rights in a dry year so that you know that you're not short, shorting yourself, if you will, at the time that you might need it the most. And so we always look at it from a variety of perspectives, but certainly the, the dry year yield is an important one. Exactly. It could, be, it could be unequal, for instance, in an average or wet year, but you really, again, you look at the dry year. Did that answer? Okay. Um, I'll move to the short-term water supply agreements with other water providers, and so we do that on an annual basis. Uh, Council, you just approved that. Uh, I believe it's your last meeting or so. Uh, <laughs> that um, uh, gives that discretion to uh, our st uh, staff to make those one year or less kinds of, of uh, water uh, agreements. Uh, historically, uh, the bulk of that water has gone to local farmers um, and it's in the form of surplus water that we declare in the spring once we know that our reservoirs are full and what the uh, uh, things like the quota coming out of Northern is going to be and those kinds of things. That's, we also come to you uh, in the spring uh, in order for you to be aware of and to uh, declare what that surplus will be. And then that then makes available uh, surplus water on an annual basis. We also do very small amounts of water. Again, uh, typically uh, releases out of the wastewater plant or union reservoir, water that is downstream of the city uh, to make uh, available for lease, um, again, on a very short uh, year or less time frame questions on that. I can tell you're all, this is almost as boring as accounting. Uh, so, but I'm just saying. I, I know, I know. I shouldn't have said that either. Um, so, is Jim still here? Oh, Jim's gone. Don't bring him back. So, extraterritorial water service agreements. Um, um, those are um, where we typically provide outside water taps. Uh, the city has historically done that um, really since probably the inception of the city, and we've done it uh, uh, for a number of reasons. In the past, they were typically done at times when the city needed to put a water line across somebody's property, somebody's farm, and they would grant a tap to the house. Uh, if you go back around the turn of the 19th century or the uh, 20th century, I should say, um, you'll find a lot of agreements along those nature. Uh, really, for the last 20 or 30 years, those agreements have been uh, uh, very few. And in fact, we've actually been trading away a lot of our outside water taps to the surrounding water districts. Namely, because um, Longmont is not in the business of providing water to residents outside the city. We really think that is more the mission of the water districts around us. 
And uh, we have successfully traded tens, if not up to 100 taps um, um, from the city to the districts. And the district, in turn, trades taps back to us that are in the Longmont planning area that will ultimately be urbanized. And so that it, it provides for a far more uniform delivery of water, also provides or, or avoids overlapping uh, systems that are very expensive, where you have the district on one side of the road and you have the city on the other, or, or worse yet, it's sort of uh, city and then district and city. So we have been working for a number of years to try to consolidate those areas uh, for a number of reasons, the, the, the primary one being uh, the uh, consolidation of, of services to those within the Longmont plan area and certainly within the city. Um, Again, those outside taps, for them to be approved, they have to go to the water board. Water board will review it and make a recommendation to the council, and the council needs to approve it. Again, staff cannot approve uh, an outside water tap outside the city. Um, and those are, um, I believe, also approved. It was approved by ordinance as well. Outside taps. Or a resolution, but again, it takes the action of the council. So you guys have to vote on that and decide whether or not the issuance of that tab is appropriate. And and in those, you really do have to make a finding that the issuance of it will clearly benefit the city. And so currently, your code is quite restrictive on the issuance of new outside taps. For water taps, the uh, standard or, or or the threshold is that uh, the the uh, user has to show that they have a failing water well. Uh, in other words, it's a public health issue for that house. Um, that's the typical standard. If that is not met, uh, staff is to reject their request, come to the council and ask, do you want us to even process it? And, um, and that's what we do. Okay. Um, the last one we have, um, actually I'm going to jump over the exchange because Ken's going to talk about that, but we also have what we call uh, emergency interconnections with the districts around us. And if you recall in the 2013 flood, um, we provided um, uh, quite a bit of water to the left-hand water district. Um, they, um, they had lost uh, a substantial part of their system, uh, including some of their uh, delivery of water to their treatment plants coming off of Left Hand Creek. And so... Um, I, again, that's an example of us working together with the water districts. Who knows, next time it may be us that right. we need uh, the support from the districts. And so we continue to um, uh, talk with the districts about those kinds of opportunities where we can provide redundancy and backup to each other um, so that in the case of an emergency, um, we're not left with dry water tasks, with no water. Well, it's um, the same thing with, like, power companies have exactly. shaft sharing agreements so that if their exactly. plant goes down, we can you deliver. You wield the yeah, power. It gives you redundancy. And historically, uh, we, we had not done a lot of that, primarily because the districts, as they were initially formed, were quite small, and their ability to provide any sort of substantial service to the city was very limited. That situation is changing. Uh, in particular, the left-hand district as well as the Little Thompson district are uh, expanding rapidly uh, to meet the growth within their districts and, and thereby providing the infrastructure to provide that mutual backup uh, if we needed it. And so that is an active and ongoing work that we are doing uh, in the water utility uh, to, to look at those opportunities, stay in discussions with the districts, and again, if those, if those come forward in the form of an intergovernmental agreement, that would take uh, the approval of the council uh, to enter into that types of agreement. Council Member Santos. Thank you, Mayor Coombs. And do we have, um, with left hand during the flood, it was a little difficult because we didn't have that agreement in place, but we did a temporary agreement. Um, have we talked to the other districts? Do we have other things in place with those other districts? Um, Mayor Combs and Council Member Santos, um, we have within our IGAs and, and certainly in our working relationships the ability to make those emergency inter, inter ties. Right. Uh, in the case of the flood, uh, we made interconnections, uh, I believe, out near uh, County Line Road mm -hmm. uh, to tie into their system. I think we could probably do additional work in that area to um, sort of formalize those a little further. Um, again, as the districts are expanding and, and making those types of improvements, it becomes more vi viable. Um, and, and actually what we would look for from Longmont's strategy or perspective 
is um, the ability to provide an average day demand uh, to the city, which is in the range of 12 to 14 million gallons a day. Uh, that right now would, uh, is quite overwhelming for, say, the left-hand district. Um, but in partnership, po possibly with Little Thompson, we might be able to achieve that. And again, those are backup strategies because you never know when it's going to be you that needs the, the backup. And so, again, we're working on that. Uh, if we're successful in those types of discussions, we'll bring that both to the Water Board and to the City Council for your consideration. Councilmember Levison. Thank you, Mayor. If, um, you know, we had that drop in water pressure recently, yes. so would we have had any agreement, you know, that would have serviced that outlying area of Longmont that we could have, um, you know, tapped their shoulder, if you will, to yes. see if they could help us? Uh, uh, Mayor Combs and Councilmember Levison, uh, I think the issue you're referring to was on a Sunday yes. uh, about a month uh -huh. ago where we had a drop in pressure. Right. That was really a system failure in our system of a communication on our SCADA system between a water tank level and what the treatment plants were seeing. And so that was a very short-term event. So you probably wouldn't activate an emergency connection for that kind of situation. You'd more likely activate it uh, for instance, if you had a major break on your transmission system or if you had a failure of a tank or if you had a failure of a big part of your treatment system, that is where you would then activate these emergency connections and, for, for a and, longer term than just a few just hours. Do it, and it really would apply to those outlying areas of the city. It wouldn't be the city core necessarily. Not necessarily, but, it, but um, I believe our... Our, our best strategy is that we figure out how we can right. serve the entire city if we needed to. Thanks. Councilmember Bagley. Thank you, Mayor Coombs. Uh, so, uh, first of all, you know more, you have forgotten more about water than, than I think I could ever learn. So, you know, uh, uh, I, guess my, I guess my question is the short-term water supply agreements with our area water providers, what percentage of agriculture and what percentage are residential, and are there other categories? Uh, Mayor Combs and enhancement. For Mayor, Mayor from Bagley, um, typical year it's going to be ninety some plus percent going to ag. Um, heavy water users that takes takes a lot of water to um, grow the crop. So, by far the largest chunk of that goes to farmers. And that, by the way, is, is leased through partnership with the St. Vrain and Left Hand Water Conservancy District. We essentially hand them a chunk of water, say 3,000 acre feet. They do the actual leasing because they have the best connections with the farmers, keeps our staff out of the middle of it. So we do one uh, sort of transfer over to the, to the district. And then what, what's that other 10% going to? Um, you know, I, I, Ken, I'm going to have Ken answer that because he probably knows it better than I do. Uh, yeah, uh, Mayor, uh, Councilman Begley, Ken use some water resource manager. Um, we do have a, a small number, and it usually ranges in the 100 to 200 acre feet a year of uh, agreements with um, other water users. Um, a good example is we have an agreement. Um, a short, we do a short-term agreement each year with um, the Lower Latham Ditch Company, which is a, is a ditch company uh, located uh, by LaSalle. They have CBT water, and for them to get that CBT water clear out to Greeley area is very difficult. So they exchange a couple hundred acre feet of CBT water to us, and we, ex in exchange, deliver water either out of our wastewater treatment plant or out of Union Reservoir, really a win-win for both of us because we get extra water supply Got out it. of it. But it, it's those, um, and we also have a few short-term fully consumable leases. Um, one is for 10 acre feet um, with uh, Western Paving who use it to augment some gravel pits, that type of small activity. Um, I don't know uh, what uh, Ms. Sugar is going to share with us, but uh, you are presenting tonight, right? No, I thought you said that Kim was going to come up and. Ken. Oh, Ken. Ken. Well, thank you, Ken. I just did. Yeah, the, the train noise has just damaged me permanently. No, the uh, she's better looking than you are, Ken. Sorry. Um, the uh, I. Training for someone. Yes. The uh, 
the, it's late. Uh, the, uh, the question becomes, uh, and it was alluded to in here, um, no long-term water supply agreements with area water providers without coming to council first. And I think if there's a difference between saying, you know, hey, we'll go and ask, you know, and then coming to council saying, you know, this is what we're proposing, this is what they want versus, you know, we got to ask mom and dad before, you know, I'm not even going there. And I think that I'd, I'd like to see that. That would send a message that basically councils really meaning what they say when they say no long-term water agreements to go towards residential development. And, and uh, Mayor Combs and Council, or Pro, uh, Mayor Pro Jam Bagley, th that is the message that we are getting as staff, is that if we're approached for a, a, any sort of long-term uh, lease or supply from uh, another municipality or something, our answer is no. Um, uh, uh, absent them coming to this podium and talking to you all. So yeah, I, I think we've got the message that we are not to spend staff time evaluating those kinds of things. But we would bring it more directly to you as opposed to us uh, working on it, then coming and talking to you. I, uh, I've got I'd, that message. I'd like, it, I'd like it to come first to us. That, that's, that's what I'd like to see. I mean, I mean yeah, my Waterboard. point is get our approval before you even consider it. That's what I'd like. Understood. Yep. Um, so I, I've hit the emergency connections. Any questions on those? Otherwise, I'll have Ken talk about the exchange issue and then what the water board conversation was on that. Okay. You're still a very striking man. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Super. Thank you, uh, Mayor, Council members. Um, did want to report uh, real quickly. Uh, we did talk with water board about this entire issue at their last water board meeting in September. Um, and they were comfortable with all of the areas that we had looked at, um, really understanding that it does take um, both water board and council review of these types of agreements. There was, was one area that um, water board had indicated that um, we may want to consider um, either some policies or some direction um, from council. Uh, the, the really, we, we have to put a little bit of thought into it. So. Um, what Water Board had talked about was the, the potential. Uh, one of the things that's happening right now, um, most of the water districts are around us um, that surround us, Longs Peak, Little Thompson, left-hand left -hand water districts, uh, as well as most of the smaller municipalities, they've pretty much been pinning their future water supply on acquisition of Colorado Big Thompson units. Um, they have really, in the last five to seven years, skyrocketed from the range of around seven, eight, nine thousand dollars a unit up to now um, well over twenty-five thousand a unit to pushing thirty thousand a unit, and a unit only gives you about three quarters of an acre foot of water. So you're talking close to forty thousand dollars an acre foot for water. So um, that's really serious. Um, that's in, an indication that the CBT market is starting to dwindle. There, uh, a lot of the units have been all, already acquired um, by municipal industrial users. So as a result, um, those water board is a little concerned that um, water districts um, are now starting uh, to acquire native basin water rights. Um, uh, specifically, we're, um, we were aware that there are a couple of the ditches up on the Big Thompson that are being acquired. And what what Water Board was was um, you know kind of talking about was well, what happens if some of the water districts start acquiring water in the St. Green Creek, and then they can't use it in their plants because their plants are located in the case of left hand down down on the left hand creek or in the case of little thompson along speak up by carter lake so they might um, try to assemble some local water and then try to do an exchange uh, with uh, longmont um, obviously before we do that type of an exchange we'd still come to water board and council but water board was was saying you know really may, we maybe uh, should have a conversation um, around developing a policy just so that um, anybody who might uh, think of that idea, <laughs> um, they're aware before they even start acquiring any water rights that Longmont really wouldn't be interested 
and doing an exchange would, would result uh, uh, in providing water that other water that we could exchange to them for um, water rights that are in our basin that we could use. You know, there certainly are water rights here that we would be interested in having. Some of our real senior water rights, um, you're always you're always interested in your senior water rights, but um, that was the one area that the water board, uh, I guess, would, would th was throwing out for possible consideration by city council either you know to, to either give us direction or or to you know ask water board to um, look a little more in depth at that one question because we, we really hadn't talked about that as as part of our presentation to water board in September and so they would be more than happy to take that back again in October um, and discuss it a little further and then and then come up with policies surrounding that so. Me, um, other than that, the uh, water board was comfortable with uh, most of our policies and procedures in place. Councilmember Levison, Ken, um, you mentioned a, ta a, um, a term that I'm not. I, I missed your the beginning of the discussion when you talked about native basin water rights. So, is a na native basin water right some like really big pond, and they could buy the whole pond? Um, our, our native basin water rights are essentially the St. Vrain Creek. Okay. The East Slope water rights as opposed to all the CBT is trans basin water from the West Slope. Okay. And so, so it's more our direct water supply. When you say native, it's like the locally grown water? The, the lo yeah, the water in, our, in the St. Vrain Creek okay. Basin. Yeah. Okay. And so basically, how would somebody else start going ahead without our knowledge to acquire those rights? Like, do we have to go to water court and read the agenda all the time? So um, we do, um, staff does, there's a, a deal called the resume, which all water rights have to go into water court, end up in a resume. So we, we do look at that every single month. Um, so we do track that. But no, they actually could acquire ownership. Once you acquire it, you've got to go to water court, which they would not want to do. Um, generally what happens is when... Uh, as, as we do here in Longmont, when a parcel of property has native basin water rights on it, um, they, if they annex into Longmont, they have to dedicate it to Longmont. In the case of property that would develop outside of Longmont, um, right now the districts are saying, we don't want your native basin water rights. You have to do, you know, you keep those, you have to go get some CBT water. If they can't get CBT water, um, then some of the local water districts they're starting to get into it a little bit because they're allowing some of the that residential development um, to occur by some CBT to, for their inside water use, and then they allow what's called a uh, irrigation system. They allow the native basin water rice to be used as a secondary, and that lowers the amount of CBT water they have to get. But ultimately, what they could do is is accept some of that water. Uh, give that, that development um, water taps uh, in exchange for that native basin, then they would be sitting there owning that. Or they could, you know, there is native basin water rights that are on the market all the time. Uh, people who own it and, and either quit farming or feel they have excess water and they sell it. So there are some water rights that um, come up on the market and they could act actively go out and buy that. So, Actually, that was my follow-up question because yeah. we've been reading a lot at how um, farmers are stripping the water from their land. And, you know, I, there is a concern because it'll make any future annexations that we might want to make in the city it, almost impossible for them to annex in unless we give them some special deal. So, uh, actually... Um just to add to that, I think uh, your your water policies now um, protect us pretty well for the Longmont planning area because uh, we have already uh, done the work to know what is the historic water on the properties within the planning area. And um, it's, it's, it's been a longstanding policy of the council that all of that historic water has to come to the city at time of annexation. And so... Uh, landowners within the planning area are aware of that, and if they uh, were to sell their uh, historic water and then come to the city and want to annex, uh, that would be known. 
and, and staff would bring that to council's attention that um, we believe the historic water probably needs to be reestablished so that we are not inadvertently drying up the Longmont planning area in order to provide water to areas outside the cities. And so that's been a long policy. I, I think one of the best examples of this happening, though, is um, it's probably been 20 some years ago. One of our neighbors to the south uh, purchased large amounts of water up on the Poudre River and um, did it without, frankly, anyone's knowledge until they announced it and went to water court to make the transfer of the water down into the Denver metropolitan area. And so we, we have a number of strategies that we are working to make sure that, A, we're not surprised in the St. Vrain and certainly not within the city. I think what Ken is getting at is that if a district were to acquire some very senior water rights, um, we may be the only entity that uh, can make the best use of that. And in that case, uh, it'd be good to have policies around, you know, what, is, what, is, what, what do we want to do with that? I, I think in the end of the day, uh, to try to keep the senior water rights local and not exported out of the basin is in our long-term interest. And so if we can um, achieve that end through, through an exchange, uh, I think it makes sense to at least analyze it and understand it. But I think that if we're forced into, it's almost like a hostage situation. If somebody acquires those native water but, rights, we might be in a situation that I had just questioned, that we're going to have to give up more in exchange but, to keep a, a philosophy. We want to keep right. our native rights as close as we can. Um, so I, I think we'd have to take a look at that. I think, I think the, the, um, the ace that we hold is um, it, there aren't a whole lot of other folks that can make use of it. So and, could and we go in? And to be able to deliver it, for instance, even out of the basin, mm -hmm. which you can do in Colorado. You can move water from one river basin to another, but you, you um, sort of pay for it in the shorts to, uh, to do that. There's huge losses that, are, that occur, and it's very expensive to do. And so when you're the um, best user, you hold a lot of cards well, on and, that negotiation. And should we be maybe looking at an, um, a um, enhancement of our water policy to say we're going to go looking for those native water rights just to which protect ourselves? Which, uh, again, and we do that. If, if, if there's a very senior water right, uh, we will go after that. But, uh, again, you got to be careful because there's a, there's a lot of sort of phantom water rights out there that, that, that have uh, really been devalued to nothing. And so you have to analyze those things. But it's, it's buyer beware. Um, and we are certainly uh, uh, watching that. We do have one more item to go through tonight, and it's already 1023. So I don't think we need to solve this tonight. So, but I do think, uh, you know, the direction is uh, I think we want the, the Water Board to recommend that the City Council consider directing staff to further discuss this issue with the Water Board and if merited, then return to City Council with additional policies and guidance for us to consider. Um, Is that a motion, we, Mayor? Yeah, yeah. Is that a motion, Mayor? Yeah, that, that's my motion. Uh, and, and, and I would agree with that. I was trying, I, I didn't realize I was on. It's, it's been a while. <laughs> Um, if that's a recommendation of the Water Board, they are there for a, quite a, a, a long time in their terms. Uh, it's a five-year term, and there's they are the, they are the experts when it comes to water. So, I, you know, if that's their recommendation, I definitely accept it, and I'll vote for the mayor's motion. Councilmember Bagley. Uh, I was going to make that motion myself. I also would like uh, the water board and staff to look at preparing an ordinance that would direct staff to not consider a long-term water supply agreement absent the express approval of council to do so. Such ordinance to state with specificity that the council's policy is not to enter into agreements that will facilitate or support extraterritorial residential or commercial growth. Do you have the water board look at that? Yeah, that's what I. That's what I'd like to. I mean, not tonight. I was going to make a motion that combine those two, but I'll make why, it after this one. Why don't we just do one? Yeah, yeah we let's can. just do one. Let's vote on the first motion.
Okay, that passes seven to zero. Council Member Bagley. Thank you, Mayor Coombs. And I just, I'm going to repeat the same thing okay. I just said. I'd also uh, move that we direct the staff along with the Water Board to please prepare an ordinance that would direct staff to not consider a long-term water supply agreement absent the express approval of council to do so. Such ordinance to state with specificity to council's policy to not enter into agreements that will facilitate or support extraterritorial residential or commercial growth with our water. Okay. Um, doesn't that already have to come to council anyway? Yeah. I mean, I, I guess I'm a little confused because it seems what, like... Uh, Mayor Combs, uh, uh, what I'm hearing is that um, Mayor Pro Tem Bagley's motion is to um, cl further clarify and reinforce um, what we understand to be your general direction and policy. And okay. so I think it, it's, and it will work with the city attorney's office, but I think I'm hearing that it's, it's a uh, further clarification to really essentially say no absent uh, council directing us to review and consider it. Okay. okay. Council Member Santos? Um, I think it would be appropriate that Water Board work on that before it comes to council. We're bypassing the ordinance itself. The correct. ordinance itself. And I, I think that's in the motion as well. That was in the motion. Okay. That what wasn't clear. Okay. okay, so you've made the motion and Jeff is seconded. All right, let's vote on that. Okay, that passes seven to zero. Great. Okay, thank you. Should I go to the next one? Um, council and uh, uh, Mayor, uh, the next item is the uh, NDRC uh, update to City Council. Um, what I'm going to do is go through it very quickly. I did it in five minutes or less down at the, uh, the state, so I'm sure I can do it here as well. <clears throat> Essentially what I want to provide the Council and the community is with an update on, on the National Disaster Resilient Competition. So what is the NDRC? Well, it is a national competition, a billion dollars uh, being uh, uh, put forth by HUD uh, for communities that have been affected by natural disasters in recent years. Um, they make the funds available, a maximum of a $500 million award to any one applicant. Uh, they have to develop, applicants have to show that they can develop an innovative, resilient project that addresses the unmet needs for disasters from 11, 12, and 13. And of course, we had the flood in 2013, thereby making Colorado, which is the applicant, uh, eligible. Um, they have to make the communities uh, more resilient by applying science-based and forward-looking risk analysis. Uh, Colorado was one of 40 eligible applicants that, that were uh, invited to submit a phase two application. Uh, it includes uh, communities within Boulder, Larimer, and El Paso counties um, who met the, the requirements of the NDRC competition. Um, it is being guided by the Colorado resiliency framework that the state has prepared. Um, and is a collaborative effort between communities, not only within the county, but again across those three counties. So how is Longmont involved in this? First and foremost, it's to look to restoring and rebuilding from the impacts of the 2013 flood. Uh, we partnered with the state and the county and other local communities within Boulder County uh, to look at this issue. And we've identified the resilient St. Vrain project for further consideration. Um, so just quickly over a description of what the city's uh, a portion of the Resilient St. Vrain project is, um, I'll go through it very quickly. Uh, again, I don't have to remind council, but um, uh, when I was at the state, I thought it was important to make the, make the case on why our community uh, should be considered uh, based on the extreme damage and impacts that we had from the flood. Uh, these are always um, um, you know, sobering uh, scenes to see and um, I believe our, our friends and communities in South Carolina are probably experiencing the same thing as we speak. Uh, so this is a phenomenon that, that hits uh, all across the country. And part of what we're trying to show in our project is how this work that we're doing can be replicated in other communities across the country. That's important to HUD. It has to be something that can be replicated. 
Ours is in particular one for a western type of flood in the western United States that is a flash flood kind of uh, situation that comes out of the canyons of the mountains. And that is what we are trying to make the case for is that what Longmont experienced can be experienced by any community up and down this front range from Montana to uh, uh, New Mexico and including the Intermountain West. Uh, it is a phenomena of the West where you have canyons where the water comes out, which is very different than the floods that are occurring in South Carolina right now where it's just massive amounts of rain and these rising rivers. So again, uh, our resilient St. Vrain project extends from Airport Road out to Highway 119 on the, on the eastern side. Um, the goals are to uh, protect vulnerable vulnerable populations. That is the uh, one of the key things. It's safety for people um, to protect them, uh, and in particular, uh, vulnerable populations. Longmont uh, has a uh, low to moderate income population that exceeds 51%, uh, which is one of the key criteria for HUD, which is why part of our project is very attractive to them. Of course, restoring the Greenway and doing it in a very environmentally sensitive and innovative approach. And what we talked about with the state are things that we're doing using natural channel design, uh, improving the, the habitat for fishery both <laughs> during a flood as well as equally important during a drought where we look at the low uh, flow channel and make sure that we're providing an environment in particular for those candidate uh, minnow species that are only found on the St. Vrain. Out at the sandstone area, it's really stabilizing the creek, restoring the greenway so we can get back to uh, uh, Sandstone Park, which everyone wants to get to, and then to really give uh, nature sort of a boost uh, to reestablish vegetation and habitat. We talked, talked with you about the, the increase in the flood flows, and, and, and part of our innovative approach is using the latest and best data in hydrology that has just been completed by CDOT and the Colorado Water Conservation Board that showed um, huge increases in flood flows coming through the city. This map shows sort of the extent. Uh, in, in yellow, it shows the current 100-year FEMA uh, regulatory floodplain. Pink shows you what happened in the 2013 flood, which with these higher numbers um, is, more, is closer to a 100-year event than the 500-year event that we thought it was. And so this revised hydrology, that's the magnitude that we're talking about, um, is, is phenomenal for us to be able to deal with. And, and uh, what we are looking at is, is, a, a, is a project that will control that and really constrain it to about a 300-foot width as it comes through the city along, along the channel. And so we're looking at sustainability, resiliency to flooding, um, the, the flow conveyance, again, for public safety, for emergency transit, for emergency services to be able to get into and across uh, the river, um, and private property impacts, and uh, obviously the cost. I think one of the other elements of this project is looking at the economic vitality. Uh, you, you heard tonight about the, the enterprise zone being established. You know, you also need to get a flood control project done if you really want to have any sort of of uh, vibrant uh, uh, economic potential in that core center of the city. Uh, I'm going to go through these very quickly. You've seen these before. They show the, the, the different reaches. It was uh, interesting to talk with the state about some of the alternatives that we're looking at, in particular at Hover Road, to try to utilize the ponds uh, uh, for uh, flood control, as opposed to them being something that can hurt us or something that can help us. Um, again, as we come down into the core of the city, looking at different approaches, uh, um, having uh, in, this, in this reach from Rogers Grove to Boston, more of a natural widening of the channel um, with a much wider wildlife corridor, and that uh, the wildlife corridors are critical to our community. Uh, we have heard that. We know that. We know that the St. Vrain is an important wildlife corridor, and uh, we sort of uniquely have the opportunity to enhance that and provide flood control. As you come through the Boston area, um, you get more of a walled section that uh, because of the narrowness of the, of the, of the uh, uh, private buildings that are in that area, we are trying to not impact private property owners any more than we absolutely have to, to provide flood control and a project that will work. And so in this particular stretch, from Boston Avenue down to the area uh, around the Burlington Northern Track, it's going to be more of a walled section. It'll be a tiered wall, but um, it'll, it won't be as wide because if you widen out, you're coming into the uh, St. Vrain Mobile Home Park or you're coming into the business park to the north. 
Um, this is a public plaza. Counts, uh, we have included that as one of the amenities in our, in our program. And the reason we included that is because public access to the river, to both enjoy and to understand the river, uh, is important, uh, both in this application and I think to our community in the long term. This was a, a this is a, an artist rendering. Uh, you know, what it would look like and what the final design and location would be would be something that we'd uh, have to work closely with the community on. Uh, to not only cite it in a, in a way that is sensitive to the environment, but also useful to our citizens to be able to, to use and enjoy. Um, this shows that section through Boston, again, where it's, it's, it's a little bit narrower, and you can see the, uh, the tiered walls that we're talking about. Um, from uh, the railroad down to Pratt, again, it's a widened area. Uh, we're actually widening out uh, what was the floodplain in, in, in that particular stretch. Um, there will be the removal of some trees. I guess I should say more than some. There will be the removal of trees. You cannot have flood control and conveyance in a channel if it is clogged with too many trees. Fortunately, our forester has been able to look at that. Many of the trees are non-native. Many of them have been weakened by the flood. And so we will be also reestablishing trees, albeit further out of the channel, um, so that, again, flood conveyance can, can uh, be preserved. This now, I've noticed that there's a lot of, like, uh, non-native, like, Russian olive-type like exactly. garbage and those, trees. You know, those need to be removed in yeah. any event. Sorry. Exactly. Uh, they're, they're sort of an invasive kind of tree species. This particular drawing sort of shows the different areas and the, the level of, of um, habitat and, and tree canopy that you're going to have. And you can see, again, through that walled section, it's going to be uh, a bit reduced. Um, but we are really probably enhancing it in a lot of the other areas as well. That's the challenge of doing a project in an urban area. Mayor Coombs, thanks. What's the wall? Can you just tell us what the circ what the different colors are? I can't read. So them. the the uh, the orange color is a lower uh, level of. I don't have my slideshow in front of me. Nick can help me with that. But um, uh, the the orange is sort of the lowest uh, level of tree canopy. Uh, yellow is a little higher level, and green is the highest level of tree canopy. Uh, the circles are, those are the nodes at the bridges where we have to really have clearance so those bridges do not become clogged and function, that they continue to function during the flood. Thanks, Nick. <laughs> uh, the sandstone reach, that's why we have great staff. The sandstone reach, again, as I said, is, is really to stabilize the creek, get our trail reestablished out there. We're working with aggregate industries in that section uh, because they still have an ongoing mining operation out there, and we have an integrated reclamation plan with them that will likely need to be amended as we go forward. So the county portion, another, another sort of interesting and I think cooperative aspect of the project that's going forward at the state level is a partnership between the city and Boulder County. And so the county's portion of this project is really west of the city. And we've said all along, ever since the flood, we need to concern ourselves west. We need to look west and make sure that those breaches are being repaired. And so the county's aspect of the project is to re repair breaches one through nine, which start all the way up at uh, US 36 and come down to the property just west of, of uh, um, 75th Street. Uh, with that downstream one um, uh, on, on Jim Hep's property being the most critical one. That is the one that we absolutely need to make sure is repaired to the highest standard uh, to protect our neighborhoods on the west side of the city. Uh, it also includes the extension of the St. Frank Greenway Trail from Golden Ponds all the way to the Braley property, which has also been a long-term uh, hope, if you will, probably one of those unfunded projects in our CIP that we've been hoping and trying to get built so that our citizens and our, and, and our public can get out to the Brawley Center. And then the county is also proposing at the Brawley Center to also build an environmental center. The city's project also has a, an ecology and a resiliency uh, education center as a component of that project. Um, our, our thought is, is that that could be situated near or in proximity to the public plaza. So again, that uh, whether it's school children being brought in, they can, they can learn in the education and resiliency center and then actually experience the river. And so that is a concept that is going to take a lot of further public review and, 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 and discussion. But we have put it in there right now and requested funding for that to the tune of about $20 million. 
And I'm going to go over some of those numbers here real quick. And so the combined project is huge, $194 million. Um, the city's portion of that that I just went over is about $164 million. Um, that also includes, by the way, an extension of the trail, of the Greenway Trail, on the east side out to St. Frank State Park. We are trying to hook up St. Frank State Park, ultimately then, all the way to the town of Lyons. That's the vision, that's the goal to tie in also with the Front Range Trail. Um, so the county's portion is about 25.5 for a total of about 194. Um, we are asking from NDRC for about 91.3 uh, million. Uh, and on top of that, we're also asking for a 5% administrative cost, which um, is important to Sandy. So uh, we are asking for that as well. Um, this sort of gives a breakout of those parts where uh, Longmont is asking for money from NDRC, so about $56 million for the major floodway components of the project. We're also asking, uh, the county is asking for about $3.5 million to repair the breaches west of the city. The city is asking for about $4 million for the public plaza, uh, $3.5 million to extend the trail on the eastern edge out to St. Rain State Park. Um, Another three and a half million for the trail extension west of the city out to the Braley property. Again, 20 million for the uh, Ecology Resiliency Center. And the county is asking for 500,000 for a more passive environmental center out of the Brawley property. We think those two can be operated and, and ran in, in sort of collaboration with each other and, and provide for different aspects of education around resiliency. Uh, and there's the 5% uh, administrative costs, which add up to about $4.6 million for a total of $95.88 million uh, in our request. I won't go over this in a lot of detail, but this is a breakdown of the city's $164 million portion where we show that we have about $80.6 million in available funding and are requesting $83.82 million as an unmet need. So the next steps in the process, uh, these applications are, are due to HUD on uh, October 27th. Uh, uh, HUD will make the award in January of 2016. And most important for council and for the public is that the public comment period started today. And it goes for the next 15 days, and it ends on October 21st. And so it is a, a two week and a day a period. Um, it, it is, it, it is uh, um, uh, set that way so that the state can pull the, the overall application together uh, by uh, October 27th deadline. People can go online to comment by going to www.coloradounited.com, selecting the link to the National Disaster Competition application and making comment. They can also uh, directly submit via email to government under slash Colorado Recovery Office at state. .co.us. We're also going to post this information on the city's website so that our citizens also have that. I think another um, good thing is that the uh, uh, second design charrette and the public hearing is going to be held here in Longmont on uh, October 15th. It will be held at our uh, utility center training room. It's tough to find rooms on, on short notice in Longmont, but we, we believe that's a, a good location to hold it. And so we will also be putting out information on, on how to get to that center, uh, the utility center for that public hearing and design charrette again, which will be on uh, October uh, 15th. And that the state is actually sending out invitations to that. And, um, uh, but certainly the public hearing component of that is intended for the public to be able to come in and make direct comment to the state who ultimately will be preparing the application on behalf of the state of Colorado. So with that, so um, Dale, questions. Um, can you talk Arnold. about the total um, <laughs> state request in the application in Longmont's yes. portion of that? Yes, if I don't have it with me at the podium, but uh, uh, the, our, 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 uh, the other big application that's out there is uh, the Colorado Department of Transportation, which is to replace some bridges on I-25 over the Poudre River and the Big Thompson River and some improvements on the St. Vrain along with some other uh, work. So the $194 million represents over half of the uh, state's overall project request. And I do have that. I ran down too quickly. 
So the the total the total request for the state. So resilient St. Vrain is 194 million. This, again, this doesn't include the admin fees. The North um, Northern Colorado uh, Connectivity Project, which is the CDOT work, is 140.8 million. Um, then they have the um, the um, capacity building projects, which are primarily coming out of Boulder County. They include things like uh, work with uh, Boco Strong uh, at Boulder County and other projects around the county. Those are in at about 84 million for a total of 419. So again, we're 50% plus uh, of the overall project. Um, I think we are one of the keystone projects that the state is um, excited about. Um, they, when we made our presentation down at the state uh, last week, they were very receptive, as was the expert panel of folks that we made the presentation to. Um, uh, officials from the state have since gone to D.C. to make the initial pitch of the state's um, um, uh, projects, and they um, they used our slideshow. So they must have thought it was okay. At least yeah, I hope there awesome. were no misspellings in it. So um, I think we're in a pretty good place. Uh, this is a huge opportunity for our community. Uh, we, we may be returning to council to get letters of support. Uh, for the project and the application. I think that always adds to the, the sense of community support of what we're trying to do. And so um, we're, we're in constant contact with the state. And uh, if that is something that is helpful, we will be uh, returning to, to ask, ask your direction on that as well. Well, anything that gets federal dollars flowing back into this community and region is a great thing. Yeah. So, Councilmember Finley. Thank you, Mayor Coombs. That was going to be uh, what I was going to ask you. What can we do to, to help? Um, one thing I would suggest is, is um, if, if you have the time uh, to make some time on October 15th to attend the charrette, certainly sending in your own comment as citizens was, is great. And I believe it, 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 it never hurts to get a, a support or a resolution from the city council in support of the application. I think that would could possibly be the, the best thing and so well, then I would direct staff to uh, <laughs> to uh, you know provide that to us so that we could vote on it Do we have another regular meeting between now and then <laughs> Can I just jump in here? It would be awesome if you guys would just give some sort of a motion to that right now to direct the city manager okay. to to prepare the letter. Uh, to prepare the letter. Yeah. Right. Yes. I direct city. Uh, I would. I would. If everyone is sure. in agreement, sure. Sure. direct sure. city staff to do that. Good idea. Yeah. So we'll definitely have that from consensus from council. I think one of the things too that we we, we okay. don't know everything that we're going to need support on. So in part we have to. We have to take, you know, we're also waiting to see what the state is going to say to us in terms of what they need. Um, and so we may very well be coming back for other items based on what we hear from them. So this is a start, but we may bring other things. And there is one thing for council to know, too. When this uh, gets back to HUD and, and they um, are deliberating on this, it's our understanding that um, they've been known to and, and very well may um, pick only specific projects from an applicant. Okay, so they they may choose just the resilient St. Vrain, hypothetically, as the only project that they want to fund out of the state of Colorado. Furthermore, they can, I think, also go within the project and only agree to fund certain aspects of the project. And so knowing that, we've also informed the state that our base project and priority was flood control and protection. And so it was the base river project uh, and the trail restoration. And so the things like the resiliency center and the plaza, all, all, albeit great, uh, were not, they were considered sort of the premium as opposed to the need, absolutely need to have. So quick question, uh, a little bit off the subject. Is the uh, Heron Lake diversion project, is that uh, pretty well done or where are we at with that one? Um, Mayor Combs, Heron Lake is under construction. Okay. I was actually just talking to staff today. Um, uh, no reason to think we won't meet the schedule to, to have it completed by the end of the year or, or before okay. our Great. eagles come back to nest. So um, 
it's it's going very well um, working with the uh, the farmers out there and the irrigation and those kinds of things uh, it slowed us down a little bit at the beginning but um, I'm, I'm told that we're under schedule and should be getting okay. her done and if you ever need an extra I mean I think your presentations are awesome and your slides are awesome but there's this guy John Bleem at uh, Platte yes. River Power John does a great job oh his presentations, I mean, he's got stuff fading in and out and rice units coming on and coal plants going off and knobs. And, on. I mean. <laughs> so, so one thing I do want to say is um, you, you, when, the, when this was first identified, actually Boulder County was very specifically called out um, in this process. Um, as staff has been working with this, I had the opportunity to talk to Molly Urbina with the governor's office. And, and frankly, her comment about our staff that's been working with this, Dale, his staff, I think Kathy's been involved. Um, her comment is Longmont's really been rock stars in this process. Um, and to see the work that's being done on this um, last week, um, the state has a consultant that specializes in this type of application. Awesome. They are working with us, and so information was going back and forth, literally drafts. Thursday, Friday mm -hmm. afternoon in terms of we want to see this, we, we need to see this, what about this? And, and so I think the pace that they've moved in this process and the work in conjunction with the state of Colorado has really been phenomenal as, as we've moved in this process. Wow. But I also wanted to say that they very specifically also said, you, you know, your folks are doing an awesome job and I know they've called them for advice and information and they use Dell's PowerPoint. So awesome. um, I think it's just a testament to the work that's being done on, on this project. The other thing is, as you noticed when he was going through the project, he was talking about very specifically a resilient project to get us through the next storm, economic impact, the impact on the low moderate income population of our community, environmentally sensitive. It, those are very specific points that they're going to score this project on. I mean, in once HUD and the Rockefeller Foundation actually look at this. And so that's why those points were being brought up in the process. And so it's not any one area. It's really how are you doing in all of those areas. And more importantly, as he indicated, can it be replicated? Because they want to be able to take these projects and show that they can be utilized in other areas of the United States. Okay. Councilmember Levison. Thank you, Mayor. We're approaching the witching hour. I'd like to move that we... Um, uh, extend the meeting past 11 o'clock to finish the rest of our agenda. We're done. Well, we still have council comments, and I don't know if Dale has anything else. But just in case, because we're, like, really close. All right, I'll second that. I'm voting no. We can't finish up in 10 minutes. Yeah, we, we, we can. I can be done if you need me to be done. <laughs> but it's, it's, anyway. He's done. He's done. All right. Council and, 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 and Council Member Levison, I, I really, I, I got to the end point of questions and wanted, uh, made the points that I think we needed to make. So, I, as far as my presentation, I'm, I'm good. That's why we love you, Dale. Yeah. Okay, there's a motion and a second. Let's vote. Okay, we got to get done by 11. <laughs> Votes. Uh, Passed by Sarah. Uh, well, it's, it's a three to four. Women against the men. Yeah. <laughs> I voted. Councilmember Santos. Thank you, Mayor Coombs. Just real quickly, um, those of you who have not heard, uh, uh, former Councilmember Mary Blue's husband, Tom Cobb, passed away on uh, September 30th. Uh, tomorrow, the um, his services are at one o'clock at First uh, United Methodist Church here in Longmont, uh, 350 11th Avenue. Um, my condolences go out to, to, to Mary and the, all the Cobb family. Um, I, uh, let's see. So um, after our long discussion about quiet zones, I would like to move to direct staff to update the quiet zone study from uh, 2010 and um, get that information back to TAB and Council um, as soon as we can. And then... Um, I guess uh, update the study, but also come up with some better numbers for uh, the individual crossing costs. Councilmember Finley. 
Oh, this was not about yeah. that. So okay. if we want to vote right. on that first, All right. then. All right, it's been a motion is in, moved in second. Let's vote on that. Okay, that passes seven to zero. Councilmember right. Finley. Thank you, Mayor Coombs. I wanted to have my business of the week because I missed it last time because we ended right at 11. Uh, my business of the, me the week would be the boot barn because it's boot weather. And the boot barn is open at 1268 South Hover Street. You can get to it, and you probably need a new pair of boots with the weather we've been having. Was everybody noticing how fast stuff is happening at the uh, village at the peaks? And uh, I mean, they almost got that intersection done. I'm really excited about that. Mm -hmm. um, unfortunately, I, you know, I really appreciate getting this invite to this October 15th by uh, my baby Angel Foundation. But we, uh, those of us that are running for office, have a uh, debate that night from seven to nine o'clock at the senior center. So I won't be able to be there. So, but I do appreciate the invite. All right, uh, city manager, any comments? No comments, Mayor Council. City attorney, any comments? No comments, Council. All right, this meeting's adjourned. <laughs>